Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the EDMAP Summit. My name is Belle Bergner. I'm the Executive Director of the North American Invasive Species Management Association, and I am thrilled to be able to open up this amazing event that is happening over two days. And I'd like to thank, first and foremost, right at the top, all of the sponsors you see on this welcome slide, without whom this event would not be possible. So I am going to just say a few words to open up the day and uh, then turn it over to our uh, first speaker. I would like to first acknowledge that we gather today throughout North America on the lands of many indigenous tribes. Here in Milwaukee, I am seated in the traditional land of the Potawatomi peoples, past and present, with honor and with gratitude to the land itself and the people who have stewarded, stewarded it throughout generations. We commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit as well. As we all know, invasive species impact the environment, economy, and public health in profound ways. And NASMA's mission is to promote, empower, and support invasive species prevention and management in North America. NASMA really started back in the early 2000s very uh, close to the time when EDMAPS was getting started, to bridge divides, to find ways to connect across boundaries, across jurisdictions, across geographic scope. And it's just amazing to see today where we are compared to back in those early days when NASMA's early founders really got together in person. The only option was to get together in person or pick up the phone and alert your neighboring land manager about the invasive species that you are seeing on your land. Well, now at the touch of a button, you can access information about what invasive species all over the continent are of concern. So today we work with so many different organizations and so many different kinds of professionals who are dealing with invasive species managing them, preventing their spread in so many different types of organizations. This is just a snapshot of some of those organizations, and I'm sure many of you represent some, if not all, of these kinds of organizations today. We have partnerships with international, national, and state and local organizations, without whom our work would not be possible. So while NASMA strives to provide tools to all of you and all the organizations we serve, we are really dependent on you all for using those tools and sharing information with us about what's working, how can we support you better, how can we improve the tools and programs that we have. NASMA is governed uh, by a 15-member board of directors. We have eight amazing staff, nine very active committees, over 450 members and partner organizations, hundreds of program participants, and thousands of followers and email subscribers. So we are very proud of where we are today being the largest invasive species organization in North America. You're going to see today some of the tools uh, that we use and uh, support and provide to our members and community at large, one of which is the Play Clean Go program. Our first speaker today, Mike Ialmini, was instrumental in helping to get the Play Clean Go program off the ground. We embed EDMAPs in a lot of our Play Clean Go outreach tools. So you'll see throughout our tools, through EDMAPs and, and other tools that we uh, provide, we try to weave together everything to make standardize the outreach opportunities, the tools, and the way that we do things across North America. Here's a snapshot of one of our new boot brush stations, actually two of our new boot brush stations in a couple different places in the US. We're very proud of that program. I wanna invite everyone today to mark your calendars for these dates to join us at our annual conference this coming September. We will be in person and virtual. So if you cannot travel by that time, there will be a virtual option, but we do hope that by that time we will all be able to be as back to normal as possible and we will have a follow-up EDMAP session very likely at this event. This conference this year is co-hosted by the Montana Invasive Species Council. Uh, very grateful for their partnership. And with that, 
I am going to stop and thank everyone again for being here today. We have a huge audience. I hope you will continue to be a part of NASMA beyond the EDMAP Summit. Tell us how this summit was. How can we support you more? Become a member um, and join our growing community of invasive species management professionals. And with that, I will turn it over and introduce our first speaker, Michael Ialmini, who is with the USDA Forest Service. Mike, as I mentioned, was instrumental in not just developing the Play Clean Go, helping to support the Play Clean Go program, but was very involved with NASMA back in its early days in, its, in NASMA's previous identity as the North American Weed Management Association. I really enjoyed working with Mike over the years. And with that, I will turn it over to Mike. Well, thank you so much, Bill. And uh, I really want to say to everyone, especially Chuck Bargeron and the whole team at uh, University of Georgia and Elizabeth and all the folks at NASMA, thanks for the invitation to help kick off the summit this week. It's going to be a really great summit. Uh, a lot of good presentations, lots of information shared on how EDMAPS is helping to unify the invasive species community all across North America. And I'd like to open it with a few common issues we face, you know, the connection to, to EDMAPS, how this is all coming together. So something we're facing collectively is this capacity shortage. And uh, you know that's not having enough to get the job done, no, no matter what that is. And it's not easy to address this. It's getting harder for most of us to reach our goals because of it. But no matter where you are, you're likely being asked to do more with less. Um, you'll see in this funny cartoon, sometimes they're just telling you to go somewhere else. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just a struggle. So how can we overcome this problem together? And are things that you're doing now, doing stuff in a way that can have someone look at this and be a supporter? Who's out there that can help you solve this? Who's out there that can help you accomplish this? What are you doing now that someone else can help you accomplish in your mission? So I think the root cause of some of this capacity gap problem is the lack of a clear connection between the quality of our invasive quality of our lives and the potential risk or impact from invasive species. So as we struggle to gain the support we're needing, there's a number of questions that are usually raised, whether they're from your supporters or your, you know, folks who are questioning what you're doing. But no matter how you view the situation, the invasive species problem is not going to go away and, and they're not going to give you a break while you're struggling. Can you articulate why it matters to your neighbor and what you need? Capacity gaps exist at all levels and in many different ways. Nobody has enough and we tend to struggle usually alone. But don't worry, you're not alone. Building strength to respond to invasions in both the public and private sectors requires a unified effort. I'd like to point out that we respond to wildfires in a completely different way. Notice, as you see this on the news, how unified the fire community is to deal with problems. So how do we get there? I'd like to start with the basics. The invasive species threat is foremost an environmental issue, but it has both human dimensions and economic aspects to consider. This factors into how people perceive it. It demands a scientific approach and it needs to be built on collaboration. These science-based approaches should incorporate advanced information management and networking to be most effective across the entire invasive species arena. But as we advance the scientific approach, it's important to be innovative. I want to stress that we don't need to be reinventing the wheel. What has come before us, the ideas, the technologies, the techniques, all of this has provided us a foundation upon which we currently stand. And the advancements in the past have led us to where we are today. Current capacities and current capabilities, the tools, the technologies, things we're using now that were once considered cutting edge are, and innovative still do work today. So invest wisely in the future. There's always room for improvement. But remember, it's an 80% game. You're not going to always reach perfection. Use what you got, make the best out of it, and move forward. So despite all of our scientific efforts, there's still challenges and barriers to success. We've all experienced this in many different ways. And sometimes we forget the social side of the issue. The pervasive streak of independence across the invasive species community plays a big part in why we're not strongly unified. So what can be done to fix this? Just think about that. EDMAPS programs and technologies can help us move in the same direction towards the goal of unification. But each of us need to help lower the barriers and challenges that are out there 
increase our cohesion and our collaboration. So, as most of you know, a great opportunity to build capacity to respond to invasive species threats is the support of the people who are impacted by those threats. So that means everybody. We have millions of potential supporters out there living all around us. Public support can come in many different ways, materially, politically, spiritually, lots of different ways we can gain support from our publics. How are you making connections with new people in other sectors or other arenas? How are you working outside of your comfort zone? Are you reaching out to new partners who can help you advance your programs? Ask yourself a lot of questions about this and see if it can give you some answers. Are you being inclusive? Well, this is where EdMaps can really help us get the job done and connect the dots. Know the enemy and where it lurks. Key steps to get the job done and to overcome the invasive species problem begin with this. Finding it, mapping it, and eventually removing it is where we're trying to get to. What we don't know can impact us and it can impact our neighbors. So by using a common language, whether that's a computer language or an approach to collecting information, and by sharing that information about occurrences and management responses, we're building capacity through networking. We need occurrence data, impact and risk data, management data, lots of other kinds of information. It all helps us get us to where we're trying to get. An example that I've seen many of you be part of is the need to accelerate efforts to tackle invasive species problem in wilderness areas and wild and scenic river corridors. These are high value areas of ecological and spiritual importance. And in the case of say the Forest Service, we manage over 35 million acres of public lands that are designated as wilderness and over 5,000 river miles of wild and scenic rivers that are designated by Congress. And the entire federal spectrum has similar numbers to that. Park Service does this, the BLM does this, Fish and Wildlife Service does this. It's a lot of great places out there to protect. And it's in the backcountry, and it's in remote areas. It's hard to get to. The Wild Spotter program provides a great solution to meet this need. And it uses existing EdMaps infrastructure and technology to engage the public, help us overcome capacity limitations to find and map invasions, and deal with them before they spread. This is a nationwide citizen science tool that anyone can use. Wild Spotter provides a great way to unify the public, builds capacity, and gains public support to address the problem. One of the major components of WildSpotter is volunteer recruitment and coordination. Citizen science is a term you're all familiar with. The WildSpotter program enlists the support of citizen scientists by empowering them in the battle against invasives, no matter where people live, work, or play. And we all need to remember to include other innovative tools and technologies that are at our fingertips, literally social media, networking, and communication. This is something that's constantly evolving and extremely complex and growing every year. It's important as we start and grow programs against invasives to advance information networking, to build community around the invasive species issue. And you know, in many cases, it's the younger crowd teaching the older crowd this time. And expanding networks and information sharing just worldwide. It's just amazing how fast information is flowing through the social media system. So how are you helping to spread the word online? And this is again where EdMaps really shines, information management and networking. There are many pieces in the information management puzzle. Data collection, data sharing, data housing, information is being managed in so many different ways. It's being updated and it's being maintained. Yet there are still missing pieces at all levels. And we need to work together to fill those gaps in every locality and across all stakeholder organizations, not just within the invasive species community. Think about how you will use the information and why it needs to be accurate. Everyone has a different perspective on this. Think about partners who are not in your traditional wheelhouse. How can you work with them to get this done? EdMaps plays a unique role in unifying programs in the sectors to build this capacity and to deal with invasives at all levels. Take advantage of the power of EdMaps programs and technologies and see how EdMaps can help you achieve your goals. By capitalizing on what has already been built, 
You can advance quicker, build a stronger network, and fill the operational gaps that you're trying to do with your program. So I'm moving along pretty quickly here, but I want to leave you with something before we end. Here's a case study using an example that we're all aware of, the COVID-19 pandemic. So as you watch what I present next, I want you to recall what I said earlier about the pervasive independent streak that we all have in the system. <clears throat> Remember, if we don't unify against the threat and work towards the same goal, we will ultimately fail to prevent and control that threat. The COVID-19 pandemic has proven this and we got over a half a million dead people because of it, just in our country. Let's not make the same mistakes again with invasive species. So this is a slide from a recent study out of the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, I'm gonna read this slide for those folks on the line here. This is a presentation about failing the test, the tragic data gap undermining the US pandemic response. Dr. Eric Schneider says, in the information age, the United States seems to be swimming in big data. This country has generated many of the world's largest, most innovative, most profitable data companies. Yet when it comes to forecasting the spread of a major pandemic that is killing Americans and wreaking havoc on our economy, we seem oddly lost. The United States was once a leader in collecting systematic federal data on population health. Now our national disease tracking effort seems to be stuck with well-meaning but scattershot efforts by tech companies using cell phone signals, social media surveys, online searches, and smart thermometers as we try to guess where the COVID outbreaks may be lurking. That the United States is failing such a simple test of its capacity to protect public health is shocking. Collecting and reporting public health data are not rocket science. You can see what the medical profession is saying about the global pandemic and clearly you see also the link to information and big data. But as you read this, it's easy to replace the pandemic words with invasive species terms and see the similarities. As this illustrates, <clears throat> the invasive species community is making the same mistakes when it comes to information gathering and sharing. Each of us can give an example of where this is happening. But ed maps can help us overcome these challenges. Let's rally the invasive species community using ed maps and not make those same mistakes that we've been making with the global pandemic. Lives and the economy are at stake. So it's been really great having the chance to share some of these thoughts with you today. I really appreciate all of you for participating. I, I want you to stay tuned more more great learning and dialogue on EdMaps during this summer is going to happen. It's really great to have people pull together for this and share those ideas. Learn more about EdMaps and see how we can unify ourselves. So please be safe out there. Take care of your friends and family. Work hard against the invasive species and just keep up the great work. And I think as Elizabeth is going to help us with some of the Q&A, we've got plenty of time for questions. Some of that might be watched in the chat box. So enjoy the summit, everyone. Thanks. Hello, thank you so much, Mike. That was an outstanding introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Brown. I'm your professional development program manager here at NASMA, and just so thrilled to be here attending the summit and participating with this excellent line of speakers today. Thanks to Bell and to Mike for kicking us off in an outstanding way. Thanks, Bell. Thanks, Mike, for getting us started today. So let's talk about why we're here. Let's talk about EdMaps. How we got here, what led to um, the development of EdMaps and the different ways that you can integrate it into your program. So first of all, I'm Chuck Bargeron. I'm the director of the University of Georgia Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health, or BUGWIC. And what we do at the center 
is really about all about partnerships and information technology, building tools to put out on the ground for people to use to help solve problems. And most of those tools end up using some sort of information technology component. We also have to research better ways of doing that and then actually put on the trainings like we're doing today. The center was founded and the center started in, in the mid nineties. And one of the original projects of the center was the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program. We were very involved in that for Georgia and entering the data, collecting the data, working with different partners to bring together this data on primarily agricultural pests and then share it with this national database. Sound familiar? The other thing that the center did was collect and scan 35 millimeter slides from labs and universities all across the country. And so we took those slides database those slides, ended up releasing multiple photo CD projects, products of those slides to share for, so people could start integrating them into PowerPoint presentations. When the collection grew too large, we ended up launching the Forestry Images website as the place to go get those pictures and get the information about them. And that was launched in 2001. We had about 3,500 images as part of that collection, which includes things beyond forestry as well. And now we have over 300,000 images as part of that, that collection. Another one of the outlets into that collection and added on to that collection is the invasive.org website. And so invasive.org is our hub for everything invasive species, including pictures and, and information tied to those. And here's what invasive.org looks like today. One of the things we were working in the forest health arena, and one of the things that in this time frame in the early 2000s started coming about was the idea of invasive plants as being part of, of forest health. And so the as, as everyone or most everyone should know, the executive order was signed in 1999, really focused, you know, and brought a federal focus on invasive species. And out from that, things came like the work Jim Miller was doing in Auburn, Alabama on invasive plants in Southern forest. And so we worked with Jim and others that, that in this area to develop a, again, a CD-ROM and then later a DVD-ROM of invasive plants of the eastern United States and then later invasive plants of the United States. And we pulled together pictures, information um, about these invasive plants and, and had that all in one, one product and then also had that available on the invasive.org website. But one of the things we kept noticing was the lack of good distribution maps. And we said, okay, what can we do about this? How can we improve these maps? How can we get better information and really fill in these gaps? So while we were doing this at Bugwood, in other places in the U.S., there were other things going on that would help us eventually get to where we are with EDMAPS. The first National Early Detection and Rapid Response Workshop was held in, two, in June of 2000 in Fort Collins. And the purpose of this workshop was to really get together what a national early warning and response system would look like, what those elements needed to be, and then what you would need to do to continue the development of that system. And I was able to find some old pictures from that workshop. And interestingly enough, our, our keynote speakers for today and tomorrow, Mike Illimini and, and Steve Manning were both um, in attendance to this workshop and some other faces that are really important to this story. Les Merhoff, Jill Swearingen and Rita Beard were also at that workshop along with many others, but, but I'm gonna pull out some ways that, that some of these individuals really helped get us to where we're at. And it's interesting that a lot of that goes back to this workshop that was held in 2000. And one of the products that came out of that workshop was this diagram here. And this diagram really focuses on what the different pieces that are needed to do early detection and rapid response correctly. And so you have that detection, you have that way that people report something and then what happens after it's reported. And as we've gone through and continue to build and improve EDMAPs, we've really focused on what, you know, this concept is kind of being key to what the process looks like. 
Shortly after that workshop, Les Merhoff, who was the herbarium curator at University of Connecticut, decided he needed a way to get out in the field more and to really get to train people about how to identify plants, how to collect plant information, and how to really do what he loved. And so as part of that, they submitted a grant proposal and were, fund, was, were funded through USDA, CSRES, now NEFA, to develop the Invasive Plant Atlas of New England. And this really became the first place where you could see distribution maps of invasive species and do reports of invasive species online. And this became the model for what a lot of others have done, including us at EDMAPS since then. Another thing that was happening around this same time is Rita Beard, originally with the Forest Service and then later with the Park Service, worked very closely with the North American Weed Management Association, which is now NASMA, to develop the North American Invasive Plant Mapping Standards. And those standards form the basis of the database that runs EdMaps and many other invasive species databases across the country. And so these standards that came out of that meeting and the needs that were addressed at that meeting and the people that were at that meeting really helped form the basis for where we're at today. As you got into the later 2000s, the iPhone was released and this really gave us that tool with a camera and a GPS unit. And the camera continues to improve to take pictures out in the field and record this information. And a group at UCLA really jumped to the forefront of that on invasive species with a project called What's Invasive. And Eric Graham was one of the leads of that project. And he really looked, saw things that, you know, smartphones can make it a lot easier to collect this information. And so What's Invasive became one of the early apps that allowed you to collect information on invasive species and report them to a central database and website. And so we later ended up working with What's Invasive and IPAIN to incorporate that data into EdMaps and ultimately consume those projects into EdMaps. Another attendee at that original workshop, Randy Westbrooks, who was with USDA APHIS and then later USGS, spent most of the 2000s going around the country and, and into Canada really talking about this concept of early detection and rapid response how important it was to do something early and helping to form different invasive species organizations at the state and province level. And so I, I think Rust, Randy was not in those pictures because I think he was actually the one that took some of those pictures. But Randy, if you never met him, he was, he's a great character and really passionate about early detection and rapid response and why it's so important. Another group that was really one of the forefront of invasive species and early detection rapid response is the Everglades Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. And that group, because of the uniqueness of the environment and the uniqueness of the problems they have there, has really been one of the leaders to the point that, that they were recognized by the Secretary of Interior and received an award because of the work that's been done there. And we've worked very closely with them, and we'll get into that later in terms of building the I've Got One app. So back at Bugwood, while this was going on, we were looking at ways to you know, think about what was going on in different parts of the country with eye pain and some of these other things and trying to figure out a way to bring that together to really solve both this electronic reporting issue as well as the distribution mapping issue. And so the first thing we did was we said, okay, let's look at Tiff County. There's four major highways going through Tiff County. What if we just did a demo and we said, okay, let's map things, put those points on a map, have photos of the locations and be able to have this interactive map of where the invasive plants are in Tiff County. And so we, we started thinking about how that would work and what you would need for that to do and how it would work as a web application. And around that same time, we um, had hired Chris Evans to, to come on as our invasive species coordinator. And Chris had just finished a master's at Iowa State. And part of what he did for his master's is using volunteers as well as experts to survey for invasive plants. And so he had a lot of experience with working on with volunteers and professionals to pull this, to pull data together and, and think about how you needed to train volunteers 
to identify different species. And, and Chris is actually gonna speak tomorrow about some of the training he has done in his current position in Southern Illinois. Another thing that, that happened about the same time that really opened up a lot of doors for us was both Google and Yahoo released an API to allow data to be overlaid on top of their Google Maps interface and or Yahoo Maps interface. And so for the first time, we, you could map and show data on a platform that everybody was familiar with and everybody was using to get directions. And so it no longer required you to use a GIS software in order to visualize data. So we said, okay, let's build a way to pull all of this data into one place, aggregate the data, simplify early detection reporting through, through web forms, and really make it where when you go out in the field and you collect data, it can go to one central place, be stored there, not going to go anywhere. We knew what long-term maintenance of a database project looked like because we were doing it with the image database. And so we built this tool to be able to do that. And so no longer was data just captured on these little cards like this old Python record we found, but it was also collected electronically and saved and shared electronically. So going back to the Python and the Everglades Sysma, another thing we did early in, in around 2010 was we said, okay, now it's time to really look at better ways to focus on reporting for the public. And so the, we had a meeting with the Everglades SISMA and, and folks from a bunch of different organizations were there as shown here. And we figured out ways to share data between the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and EDMAPS on invasive animals. And the decision was made to take the 188 number, I've got one number, make it statewide, going from something that started in the Keys. We decided to register the I've got one.org website and make that the portal into EdMaps for Florida, and then build a smartphone app focused on reporting invasives in Florida and making it easy to report things like Python to Pythons to the appropriate um, individuals. And so about a year and a half later, we launched the, the I've Got One app. Funding for that was provided by the National Park Service, Everglades and, and Big Cypress National Parks. And since then, that app has been downloaded 57,000 times, and we've had over 6,000 reports into that app. And most of those are from the general public trying to, just trying to help. And those reports come in because of the, advertising and the promotional activities that are done around the I've Got One, whether it's billboard, bumper stickers, news articles, there's a lot of information that all ties back to that telephone number, website, and smartphone app. And so we went from the Everglades and our next project with EdMaps was in Alaska. And what we did in Alaska, working with the Forest Service and the University and Heritage Program there, is to take their database and visualize it on a map. And, and this really pushed the limits of what the Google Maps API could do. Uh, we were mapping both positive and negative data. And there was, I think, about 80,000 records at the time that we were trying to display on a map and make interactive and make load fast on these different species. And so it really enhanced through this project what we were able to do with the mapping interface. From there, we started working with the Missouri River Watershed Coalition and the Center for Invasive Plant Management at Montana State at the time to expand and, and have EdMaps reporting for those states, which eventually became all Western states and EdMaps West. Then Jill Swearingen, one of the attendees to that initial workshop said, hey, let's do this for the Mid-Atlantic region of the U.S. And so with some funds from the National Park Service, we were able to expand into the Mid-Atlantic parts of the United States. And we the pieces started coming together. We started looking at these regional networks and ways we could do things better and share data and figure out, you know, these different projects. And more and more partners came on board. We, we had some projects with Fish and Wildlife Service, with Army Corps of Engineers, APHIS, and, and through some state departments of ag, some NEFA funding, as well as some nonprofits and private groups. And, and we started to expand into Alberta and Ontario at this, around this time as well. 
And then we said, okay, let's look at this from a national U.S. level. How can we, you know, not do things so fragmented? And so we worked with the forest, U.S. Forest Service, Forest Health Protection, to look at a way to fund EDMAP. So the core part of EDMAP is the data collection and aggregation and, and some general functionality at the national level, and then still be supported with projects at the state and regional level as well. So we started working with the Forest Service, then providing some annual support for EDMAPs to really get it where it's at today. And I really thank them for that. And so as EDMAPs continued to grow, then more and more people started looking at it and going, well, what else can we do with this? And so we worked with Utah um, Weed Supervisor Association, Utah Department of Ag and Montana Department of Ag to really build the product that you're going to learn uh, hear about later from a couple of the folks that helped us come up, came up with it, EDMAPs Pro. And EDMAPs Pro the goal of it is to really change the story of the data. So you're not just showing points on the map, you're showing the action on the ground. You're showing when things change from treated to eradicated. You're showing when species are not found. You're changing the story around the map to really build things up and, and better sell the product. And that's um, better sell the work you're doing. And that's what some of the decision support decision making and funding panel tomorrow is going to look at even deeper. We worked with the Invasive Plant Control, Invasive Plant Control Incorporated to build a system to track treatments and hours and methods and chemicals. And so we built that for them and then we're able to take that and work with um, Minnesota Department of Agriculture and University of Wisconsin to expand that to a tool that they could use that would sit on top of EDMAPs and allow them to do a lot more tracking than you can do with the standard EDMAPs package. We started working, and you're going to hear more about this afternoon, in the more traditional agriculture arena. And we launched Ag Pest Monitor last year as a way to track more than just invasive species, but other economical, economically important pests in agriculture. We worked again with the Forest Service, but at the national forest level, to build a citizen science platform for reporting invasive species, kind of focused at the forest level. So you're mapping invasives in your favorite places. You're mapping invasives in the places that you, the public lands that you enjoy, you know, with a different audience in mind than the traditional EDMAPs. And so kind of building that EDMAPs light system, which we'll talk about a little more this afternoon. And then it, on the opposite end, taking the data and using that data through models in ArcGIS to be able to target what infestations based on different criteria should be treated first. So to sum up my introduction, this is where we're at today. EDMAPS is this ultimate aggregator. It's working on invasive species, biocontrol, pest data, working across geographic, political, and organizational boundaries. There's tools from everybody to use at a national or international scale down to the CWMA and CISMA local scale. And we're continuing to improve it and continuing to add new tools, some of which you'll hear about today. But we're also focusing on what's important, telling the story, filling in the maps, showing the true distribution. We're merging things into one, one platform, both for the smartphone apps and the website. So no more regional projects trying to make everything under one EDMAPS brand. And we're getting there with the addition of Canada as part of the core EDMAP system. And you'll see as the maps have expanded now to include Canada. Continuing with the online reporting through the web interface or through the different apps, two of which you're going to hear about today, the EDMAPS app and the EDMAPS Pro app. We're continuing to work at a national level to help continue to improve and build this early detection and, and rapid response framework by having some of these tools that can help along the way. Looking at what kind of data is needed when there's a detection, you know, whose jurisdiction is it in, you know, is the identification correct? Has a risk assessment been done before? And then what kind of response is available for that 
new report and then making sure that all of that data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, that it can be shared, that it can be downloaded, it can be used in the models we're going to hear about tomorrow. It can be used to tell a story, to, to sell what work you're doing and to continue to do that work. And we're trying to build a tool for every job. Maps, we think of EdMaps as this toolbox, and there's all these different tools that go in that toolbox. And some of them are for different users. You know, we look at the app and the website for more casual users. We look at I've got one and the Wild Spotter app is more of the public. And then as we pull data from our naturalist, you know, another way to get data from the public. And then having the more professional apps with EdMaps Pro, AgPest Monitor, ISM Track, and then making this data available um, for researchers to really get you know, be able to get the data from one place. So to sum up, you know, what I really wanted to start off with is tell y'all that this is not possible without the partnerships and without the work that each of you are doing on the ground. And all we're trying to do with EdMaps is have a tool to make it easy where you can use early detection and rapid response as a educational tool for the public and then also help build this rapid response infrastructure. Make it easy for you to so show your successes and make those tools available. Because at the end of the day, it's not about mapping. The goal is eradication and the goal is public awareness. And so anything we can do to, to help support you in that goal is what we're trying to do with this. And finally, I want to thank, you're going to hear from some of the EdMaps team today in the next pres few presentations, but I also want to thank the folks behind the scenes that are doing the programming of the website and the apps and making sure everything works the way that it should. And so I want to thank them and I want to thank y'all and I hope you enjoy today and tomorrow. And, you know, I, I put this picture of my son and I, I is there because, you know, we all can't, we all aren't going to be Superman. We all aren't, can't do everything. So let's figure out what we can do and do a good job of it and, and come up with something that, you know, makes a difference. And that's, that's what we're really trying to do with EdMaps. And, and I think what most of you are trying to do in your individual jobs and careers. So thank y'all. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Carroll and I am the Citizen Science Project Coordinator for the University of Georgia's Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. And today I'm going to be introducing you to the EdMaps app. So hopefully by the end of today's presentation, um, you'll feel comfortable going out into the field and reporting invasive species, pests, or biological control agents that you may see. To note, I'm going to be showing the EdMaps app using an Android device. The iPhone app is very similar in design, but where differences do occur, I'll try to highlight them so you are aware of them. So to begin, you're going to need to go to your appropriate app store, whether that's the Play Store for Android or the Apple Store for iPhone. And you're going to need to install the EdMaps app. And once that's installed, you're going to go ahead and open. And you're going to be greeted with some brief informational slides um, about the EdMaps app. So feel free to swipe through. And then we'll go ahead and get started. So before you're taken to the home screen of the EdMaps app, you're going to need to select um, the state or province, if you're in Canada, that you're going to be reporting in or are currently located. And this just cues the EdMaps app to download the appropriate um, species field guide for you. So I'm going to go ahead and download the Georgia field guide. And once that's downloaded, you'll then be taken to the home screen. So on the home screen, there are two different categories. You have report observation and species information. And under the species information, you have different categories. And these species are species that were downloaded within your field guide. 
The report observation allows you to also report from the field guide species, but you also have the opportunity to look on the server for all invasive species, pests, or biological control agents. So you have more species that you can select from up here in the new sighting or negative survey. So before we talk more about those two sections, I want you to go ahead and select the three horizontal slides in the top left side, and this will open your dashboard. So on the dashboard, you can easily get back to that home screen. You can change your state or province if you travel for your job or are just traveling and need to report um, a new sighting that's in a different uh, state or province. You can update your settings as well as provide us feedback if you're experiencing any issues with the app, you would do that through here. So I won't go through every one of these, but just know that this is the dashboard is where you can easily jump from different sections of the app. So we're going to start by uh, selecting EdMaps login. And this is where if you already have an EdMaps account, you're going to enter your credentials and hit sign in. If you don't have an EdMaps account, you're going to hit register and you're going to fill out the information on the screen. Now, reporter category is just, you know, whether you're a professional, a volunteer or a citizen scientist using the app. And then profile, you can decide whether you want your profile to be public, which it's public if the icon is blue. If you'd like to keep your profile private, make sure that the circle is white. So again, it's whatever your preference is, whether it's public or private. And then you're going to hit register. So I have an EdMaps account, so I'm going to go ahead and log in. Don't worry, I'm, I've changed my password since logging in. And you're taken back to the home screen. So on here, we're going to begin by looking at the species information category. So we're going to, I'm going to select plant. Feel free to select whatever you would like. And again, this is just the list of all the plant species from your field guide. And you can easily sort these species by scientific name or common name in the upper top right, whatever you're comfortable with. Or if you know what you're looking for, you can search here in the search button. I'm going to go ahead and pretend I saw velvet leaf. So I'm going to select velvet leaf where I am then taken to a species specific information page. So this page will look different depending on what species you select, whether it's insects, wildlife, or plant. The information in the detail section will vary. But here, this is for identification purposes. You'll get a brief overview of the appearance of the species and any other information we may have. You can also select the image icon and you'll be taken to a selected uh, few uh, images from our Bugwood image database that will also help with identification purposes. And you can swipe through. And then if you are connected to Wi-Fi or data, you have this map feature icon that you can select. Again, you need to be on your data plan or Wi-Fi. But the map feature, and we'll do the prompts. So yes, I'll let EdMaps use my device location. The map feature lets you see the up-to-date point distribution maps that we have, so Ed, that we have for that species. And so I've looked at all this, and yes, I think this is the species I've seen. I want to report it. You can easily do that through this section by selecting the report button in the top right side, which will take you to the report form. And on the report form, um, going this way to the report form, some information is automatically filled in where others needs, other information needs to be filled in by you. So doing it this way, species is automatically filled in as well as observation date. You can change observation date if you know you're filling out this report 
couple days later. Feel free to update that as needed. And within plants only, you do have the option to add more plants to this report form, to this specific siting. And you'll do that by selecting add more plants. And you'll be taken to the current field guide list of plants that you have. You have a couple other options down here at the bottom. So this star, which we'll talk about here in a minute, is your my species list. And so that's a customizable list that you put together. This icon takes you back to the categories. So you can go ahead and select that. And then this icon, which I don't have, but our recent species that you've looked at. So if you have species that you've recently seen, you can go ahead and select them there. Or if you have, you have a species that is outside of the field guide, you can select this search button. And this will take you to all species that are on our server. So if you're interested in a species that is not on your field guide, you can enter it here and that will be added to the reporting form. So for today, I'll just say I saw a Norway maple and it gets added to this specific sighting. Now I did want to note, again, this is only for plants and it assumes that all other information that we're gonna discuss here is the same for all species that are listed. So for me, both Norway maple and velvet leaf. And it assumes that the location is the exact same and we'll go over this in a minute. They're both positive sightings, the habitat's the same, the density's the same. So that's where you wanna be careful if you are using this feature um, because it assumes that for both species, all the rest of the information is the same. So I'm gonna delete that for now and talk about some of the other parts of the reporting form. So when you are reporting an invasive species, a pest or biological control agent, you're gonna wanna tr uh, try and upload images to your reporting form. And this is just important because it assists the verifier in the verification process. So to do that, you're gonna select this image icon and you're gonna have a few pr prompts to go through. And then to upload images to the reporting form, you have two options. You can choose images that you've previously taken of that sighting on your phone. So choose from gallery, or you can take pictures right now in the moment and that will bring up your camera. So for today's presentation, I'm gonna do choose from gallery and I'll just pick an image that we already have on this phone. And it gets added to this report form. Another feature is hide exact location, and this is worded differently on um, iPhone, but it's the same function. And this is if you are interested in making sure your report for the general public is seen at a county level. So it hides the exact location. And if you're on private property, this might be important, or it's a species that you just want it to be at county level instead of an exact location you would select that to turn it on or turn it off. And again, if you have it on the report form to the public, the report to the public will be shown at county level instead of the exact level. The next part of the form is location. And so if you have your device a GPS location turned on, the longer you stand in a certain area, the more accurate your location is going to become. And you're gonna to wanna to select this map icon over on the right to just verify that your location is accurate as well as do some other map features. So this is different on Android and iPhone. So I'm gonna talk about Android first and then do iPhone. And so on Android, you have two options for your map feature. You have point and polygon. And point is really good if you have a small infestation or a single sighting and say this is where I'm currently standing but the report was actually over here, you're just gonna tap the screen and that's gonna move the mark for you. Now, if you have a larger sighting, a larger infestation, you're gonna do polygon. And within Android, you have two options. You have freeform or vertice. Freeform is when you touch the screen 
and just draw the polygon and it automatically fills it in for you. And so this is the infestation that you saw. If you don't like the free form that you drew, just go ahead and delete it and do it again. Another option is vertice. And what you're gonna do for this one is instead of drawing, you're gonna tap. So you're gonna put points on the screen in a clockwise position to create that polygon. And when you're happy with it, you're gonna hit done. And then your location is up to date and accurate on the reporting form. So for iPhone, there is just some slight differences in this feature. So you're still gonna have the map icon that you're gonna select and you still have point or polygon options. For point, you're just gonna tap the screen and place the point on the map where that infestation occurred. And again, this is for um, small infestations or a single occurrence. And you'll hit done when you are done. If it is a larger infestation, you're going to hit polygon. And again, in a clockwise position, you're going to tap the screen. So you're gonna tap once to start the polygon and continue tapping in a clockwise position until you have completely covered that infestation area. And once you're happy, go ahead and hit done. Or if you wanna restart or you aren't happy with the polygon, you can hit the trash symbol and restart as well. So those, that's the differences between Android and iPhone for this map feature on the reporting form. All right, jumping back to Android and the reporting form. Some other options that you have are time spent, and this is a great option for volunteers to track their hours. So say you spent 10 minutes surveying um, this area. Infestation status is, you have three categories, and this is where that species that you've listed at the top, it's positive if you saw that species at the time of the report. So that species was there. It's treated if that species was there and you applied control efforts. And it's negative if that species was not there um, at the time of the report. And we'll talk more about negative surveys here in a minute. So for this form, I'm gonna leave it as positive. I saw velvet leaf during this report. And the other parts are just to the best of your ability. So infestation, pick the best category. For me, this is on UGA campus. I'm gonna say it's a managed, I'm gonna say it's a yard garden. If you did a polygon for location, your area will be automatically filled in. If you did a point, you're gonna to have to fill that in. Density is straightforward. How dense was that infestation or how thick was it? And we'll say this one was pretty small. And then any other notes that you think is relevant to the reporting form and for the verifiers, make sure you add in the notes section. So I'm just gonna add that this is an EDMAP summit report. And when you're done and everything is accurate to your ability, hit save. And when you hit save, that report is saved to your upload queue, uh, which we'll talk about here in a minute, or if in your settings you've selected instant upload, which I'll show you, that report is instantly sent uh, to the server and the verification process begins. So one other feature on the species information page I wanna talk about is this star button. And again, this star is your my species list. So I'm gonna select it. Try again. All right. My, so velvet leaf has now been added to my species list. And the my species list is getting back to the dashboard. My species list is just a customizable list that makes for easy access for finding and reporting these species. So maybe you only know a handful of species that you're comfortable identifying or your job is only interested in a couple species. You can add them to your My Species list for easier finding and reporting purposes. 
And you can always edit that list using edit. You can add or remove species at any time. You can search it as well as sort it by common name or scientific name. So two other options I want to show you, getting back to the home screen, are under this report observation category. So we have new sighting, which we're going to go ahead and select. And this is another way to get to the reporting form. However, you can tell species is not automatically filled in. So this is where you need to fill in the species that you have seen. And again, you have the different categories, different icons down here at the bottom. You can use my species list, use the categories, recent species, or search the server. And you will add your species. And it's now been added. And everything else is the exact same as the rest of the form. So you're going to have to add your images. You can update the observation date if need be, hide your location, and so forth. Now talking about negative surveys, I briefly mentioned that you could do a negative survey the other way through the reporting form, or you can do it through this button. And so a negative survey is just as important as a positive survey. So not finding an invasive species, pest, or biological control agent is just as important. So if you are out surveying an area and you don't see certain species, go ahead and fill out a negative survey. And so again, some information is automatically filled in, like the date, time, but you will have to update your species list. So we'll just do... And we'll add that. Your time spent, again, great for volunteer hours. And then you are gonna have to edit your area surveyed. So we're gonna hit edit, and we're gonna hit that button to quickly go to where I'm located. And then everything else is the exact same as I've mentioned for the map feature for both Android and iPhone. So we're just gonna do a point here and we did not see velvet leaf at this location. And again, add any information that you might think is important and hit save. All right, now getting to the upload queue, this is the last thing I'm gonna talk about today. So I've mentioned when you've saved your reports, this is where they are saved unless in your settings you have turned on your instant upload. So if you want your reports to be instantly uploaded to the server for verification, that is where you will turn it on. And again, that's in your settings on the dashboard. However, if you don't have that turned on, this is what your upload queue looks like. Again, it's in the dashboard and it's Q. And this is where all your sightings are until you upload them. And you have to be connected to Wi-Fi or data to upload your reports, even for instant upload. So make sure at the end of the reporting session, if they aren't uploaded, to upload them for verification. Otherwise, they just sit on your phone and don't go through the verification process. You can edit your reports until they've been uploaded through the app. So you would just select the report you want to edit and make sure that the information is correct. And if everything is there and you want to upload them, you select this button and go ahead and select the reports you either want to upload or potentially delete. And if you want to upload them, you hit the upload icon here. And if you want to delete them for any reason, you select delete here. And so that is your upload queue. And so with that, I hope you feel more comfortable using the EdMaps app, and I will do my best to answer any questions you may have that something I may have missed during today's presentation. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the, to the EdMaps Pro presentation, and hopefully it looks like the audio issues with my presentation are, are better with these. So we're going to do that, and then we will, I think the break is after that, and then we'll move into the other presentations.
Good to be with you today. My name's Kevin Bailey. I work for uh, Juab County out of Utah and I'm the weed supervisor there. What we're going to talk about today is EdMaps Pro. But where we need to begin is edmaps.org. You need to have a login, uh, username and a password. Uh, you can do that by going here, signing up and, and getting that here. Uh, for time constraints, I'm going to log in and go through the process. Once you've got that login, you can log in and it's going to bring you to the home page of edmaps.org. We're going to go to My Edmaps, which is where we're going to spend our time to set up Edmaps Pro. First thing that we're going to set up is, is our species list. So this is unique to the user. You can go ahead and add individual species by typing in that species or from a scroll down screen and you can put and add the species. What I've done today is I've went ahead and I've added a state list. So I clicked on Utah Noxious Weed List. I added that list and this is what popped up. It's really user friendly. If I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna map more garlic mustard and I want that at the top of my list, I want to move this to the top of that list and you can go and, and arrange this any way you want. If you don't have any of some of these weeds in your area of working, you can go ahead and delete them off of this list and it's really user friendly and specific to the user. Once we've done that, we want to come back over to the left side of our list and we want to go where it says EdMaps Pro Tools. We click on that and we want to create my county list. This is where all of the data is and specific to your county or your area. You go up here and you click your, click your state and click your county and then you add it. And that's what I've generated down here. And all of these other counties are surrounding counties of Juab County. So again, it's a user thing and makes it more unique to the user. Back over to the left side underneath EdMaps Pro Tools, photo projects. Now this doesn't show up here unless you open up the app and sign in and then you go through the photo project process and make it so that it is here and linked with edmaps.org. So I went ahead and done that and I'll show you how it comes up. So I've done a, a practice test here for this summit. Again, if I don't want this to be active on my phone, I can hit the trash button, make it inactive. And then when I sync, it's not going to be uploaded on my device, uh, meaning phone or tablet. I can also make it so that it can be user friendly between users. I can click users. Again, you can see that I've shared it with Jerry. I'm the main one for this and I can add other users like the, the folks that spray for me, I can add them here. And then they also have this out in the field. So I'm going to go back to my EdMaps to talk about the last thing before we move on to EdMaps Pro. The last one is my KMLs here. And it is labeled different on EdMaps Pro. What you can do or have the ability to do is you can have a KML, a project area, track logs or something associated with that and you can put those in on edmaps.org and it will sync with edmaps pro so again i go up here and i choose my file i name the layer of what i want it to be and then i press upload and that's how i've generated this list we're going to move over to edmaps pro now so you go to the app store and you download it Again, it's the same username and password for EdMaps Pro. And I've went ahead and I've already signed into EdMaps Pro. And this is kind of what it looks like. So this is the, this is our map. You can have more detail or less detail, just depending on how you want to do it. And this, as you can see, my data points here. And as I scroll out, they can, they show up on the map. Where we're going to be spending our time is over here on these desk drawers. So if I click on these desk drawers, it's going to pull up a, a list here. The first thing that I like to show specifically is the app settings. One reason for this is, is because these two things right here is, is that I went ahead and I messed with my state species list and I want that to show up in a specific way on this app. I need to go ahead and click on that and refresh that. So whether I have a re refresh on the species list or the refresh on the state species list, you can click both of them and it will refresh your list. Also a good place if you need to send feedback, if you're having trouble 
with the app. Again, we're going to go back to our desk drawers and we're going to, we've done the invasive map. We're on to photo projects. This is the same thing and it's set up the same way as it is on edmaps.org. Over here to our right is where you'll download it. And I've already downloaded it to save time. You can click on it and it brings it up. You'll come over here and you'll click on your photos that you've taken. And this is the photo that I've taken of, of, of my desk here. And again, it's to the user. You can go out and you can take a bunch. So if I've got a whole area here where I want to take photo points to be able to show my data uh, year after year or progress, I can do that. What it does is I take the first original photo and then the next photo that I take the next year or a month down the road, it kind of ghosts that picture and then so that you can take the same picture that you took previously. And again, it's user friendly. We can pass that between users using edmaps.org and being able to share that through the users. So we're going to go back to our desk drawers here and talk about the data sets. This is the data sets that you shook, you first saw when I opened up the Edmaps Pro app. Over here on the right, there is a button that, that is the download button and I have pressed all of those and I've downloaded all of this data. So Juab County is my county and this is my data and all of this other is the surrounding counties. I can toggle these on and off and making it so that I've got some, all or some of the data that is associated with each data set. And again, it is specific of what do you want within your data set. So let's go back to our drawers. Uh, the next one is offline maps and hopefully this is in Utah, we have a large amount of area where we do not have cell phone coverage and you can download these map offline maps and be able to see exactly where you're at and where your data is. Because when you get out in those areas uh, right now, all it is basically just a blank map. You can use KMLs where you can download your roadmaps and soon, hopefully we will have those offline map tiles that will be user friendly and you can zoom and it shows you exactly where you're at and, and this part we are still working on to make them better. We'll go back over to our drawers again. So project area. This is where those KMLs are. This is what it's named on as project areas on edmaps.org. It is the my KMLs. You can toggle these on and off. You download them and you can toggle them on and off whatever way you want to do it. You can delete it and it's not on your device and it's specifically for each user. So we're going to go and see one of these so that so we'll go back to our drawers and we go to the invasive map. And once the invasive map pulls up, I can pinch my screen on my phone or my tablet to the project area and find that area. And I'll be able to zoom right in on it. And you can see that I've got data and it's my project area that I've downloaded through a KML. The blue is my project area and all of the white is my track logs. So back to our drawers. Uh, the last thing that, that we need to talk about is the upload queue down here. So I press the upload queue. This is where everything gets, whether you take a point, you revisit some of the data, your photo points, anything that is involved and you press save, this is where it goes so that you can go ahead and eventually at the end of the day, when you get back to service or you have service, you can go ahead and press the action and, and go ahead and down here at the bottom, it says upload and you can select all of them. You can go through and, and touch each and every one of them and upload and up, be able to upload this to edmaps.org. And then once you're done with that and you have everything uploaded into there and you've got to do whatever you need to do on edmaps.org, you can go back into the data set and refresh your data set right here of everything that you changed and then it will download it back to your device and pretty much before you go out every day you've got to make sure that you've got the yesterday stuff that you put in or updated you'll want to make sure that you update it before you go out the next day Thanks, Kevin.
My name's Jerry Caldwell. I'm the Twila County Weed Supervisor in Utah, and I'm also the president of the Utah Weed Supervisors Association currently. I'll be doing the second half of this presentation. Now we are going to show map settings. In the upper right corner, there are two gears to access it. This is where you select what you will see on the map. Starting on the top, you have your offline maps. This has zoom limitations due to the size of the files of the aerial photography. We are having new offline map tiles coming soon. This is an offline version of OpenStreetMaps. Then there's auto follow. When you select auto follow, you have two options to keep your direction or north is always up. Next is map type. You have normal satellite and terrain to choose from. Then we have displayed. You can toggle all reports and photo projects off or on all at once. Next there are filters. These help you narrow down which points you want to see on the map. Data sets have a lot of points that you might not want to show. The state list currently has seven states. You can pick and choose all or multiple weeds to display from the different categories. You can add specific species, one or as many as you want. This shows the number of points for all of your species also. Observation date. You can show or hide in three month increments up to 15 months. Then you have last date revisited. You can show or hide all of your recent vis revisits also. Then we have report status option, which are positive, treated, eradicated, and negative. If you have any filters on, you'll see the options to clear all filters. This resets everything back to the start. Then there are the by unverified option. These are orange in color. They are mainly used for navigating to points for ground truthing. Okay, now we're gonna work with some points. Okay, first we'll add some new points. So we're gonna touch the plus button on the bottom right corner. You'll have four options. Use my location, draw a polygon, drop a marker, take a photo. We'll start with use my location. Now this will put you wherever your GPS locates you at. So we'll add the species and we're going to take a photo, take a picture, use the photo. Okay, you can add multiple photos if you'd like. You can also select a picture from your library if you need. Okay, then we're going to slide down here. Now, if you happen to need to move this point, from where you're actually sitting, you touch this little icon next to the coordinates. It'll bring this map up. And you simply slide to where you need to be, touch the screen, the little blue dot will appear and that's your new location of your point. Then you click done. OK, 
Okay, then you come back down, you're gonna fill in the rest of your attributes. You can put habitat, time spent, you can make it private. So I'm gonna add my density. I'm gonna add my acreage. It's a positive point, you have treated or negative. And you can put notes in the bottom box if you need to. Then you click save. Okay, report has been saved in the queue. Now you'll notice that there's the white point on the map signifying that there's a point in the queue waiting to be uploaded. Okay, next, draw the plus sign. We're gonna draw a polygon. Okay, so there's two kinds of polygons, vertices and sketch. Vertices, you simply touch the screen on the boundaries of your weed location. Sketch, you'll touch the screen and then hold on to the point and you'll draw a freehand polygon. Then you'll hit the arrow button over, click done. It'll bring this box back up. You'll pick your species. You'll take your photo, take a picture, use my photo. Now you'll notice in the acreage box, it'll show you the acres of your polygon. So you'll fill in the rest of your attributes and we'll say that was treated. You can put notes if you'd like. Click save. Report has been saved in the queue. Okay, now you'll notice there's a point instead of the polygon on your map, but it did save the polygon, but it shows it as a point. So you don't clutter your screen up with that. So now we're gonna do the next one. So let's say you're you want to put a point in the middle of your screen. When you drop a marker, that will drop the point in the middle of your screen. Now, if you have to move it, you just hold on to it with your finger and you move it where it needs to be, let go. That's where your point is located. Click the arrow, click done. You're back to this dialog box here. You're gonna select your species. Take your photo, take a picture, use the photo. You can also take multiple ones here too. If you need to move it, you can still move it right there. Then you're gonna fill in your attributes at the bottom. With your acreage, done. Positive, treated, or negative. Do treated, and then save. Okay, it's now in the queue. Okay, next, you got take a photo, which is basically doing it in reverse. So we're gonna take a picture first, use my photo, then the dialog box comes back up to take your attributes. So we'll select our weed, density, acres, positive, treated, or negative. And then we're gonna click save. It's in the queue. Okay, now you'll notice there's four white points on here. We've done one of each weed that are all in the queue waiting for us. Okay, now let's do a revisit. So we're gonna select a point to revisit. All right, we're gonna report a revisit. Comes up a scotch thistle. You can take a photo if you'd like. You're monitoring. It's now 5% of that one acre but it's still there, positive, we'll click save. Okay, now you'll notice that point is gray. That just signifies that there's a revisit sitting in the queue waiting. Okay, now let's contest a record. Okay, we'll select a record.
Then we're going to hit View Details. On the bottom left, we have Contest Record. Select that. Now, if you contest a record, you have to put a reason. So we're going to put wrong species on this. Then we're going to click Save. OK. OK, now that when uploaded, that's going to go back into the queue of the local or state verifiers. OK, now we're going to verify a record. Now, orange signifies unverified records. So we'll select an orange view details. Now you'll see on the bottom there's verify record. Now this is mainly for the verifiers in the state and local. Your unverified points will show up on only your screen until they're verified and refreshed. So we're going to click verify record. Credibility, let's say it's credible. This is the place where a verifier can do whatever he needs to do to it. He can change the species also if it is the wrong species. So we're going to say it's credible. Method, we got photographs. A source was from a county government. You can put comments in. You can either release or make it private. Okay, then we're going to click Save. Now it's in the upload queue. Okay, so we've now done new points, revisits, contest, and verify records. Now we'll go to the, your, on the drawer on the left side, we're gonna go to upload queue. Okay, now here's everything that we've just done on here. So we've got new observation, a revisit, a contest, and a verified. These can still be edited at this point by selecting them, and you can do what you have to do click save and it's there. Now, if you find out here's one, you really don't want to do it. You're just going to swipe to the left and delete and it's gone. Okay. Now everything looks okay. We're going to up on the upper right. You've got actions. We're going to select. We can just hit the select all button if we'd like. And then on the bottom right, we're going to hit upload. Okay, all of your points are now uploaded. Go back to your drawer, invasive map. And now they're off your screen because they're uploaded. So in order to get them back on, you need to go back to your data sets, click the refresh button, and this will download a fresh new copy of your points. It might take a few seconds to do it, but it's generally pretty quick. Okay, now they're there. So we'll go back to the invasive map and all of our new points should show up on the map. Okay, now I'd like to spend a few minutes on photo projects. We've recently done some updates on this, so I'd like to go through it right now. Okay, so we're gonna hit our uh, drawer up on the upper left corner. Then we're gonna select photo projects. These are all the projects that I have in my account. So to add a new photo project, we're gonna create a folder first. So we're gonna hit the plus sign, and we're going to create this folder and we're going to call it and head maps project done and save okay now it will put it on the bottom until you've gone out and you come back in and then it will alphabetize it for you so that's our folder so now we're going to select the folder and this is going to be the plus sign up on the top right is going to add my new point in it. 
So this is going to add a photo point. So we're going to call this uh, training. Done and save. Okay, now I have my point called training. Now I'm going to add my photo to that. So I hit on the photo on the side, and then I'm going to hit the plus sign to add a picture. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to name this 2021. Done. I'm going to click the camera. Okay, so now I'm going to take my picture, focused. All right, 2021, and save. Okay, now I have my photo. Now, I can actually put in more points, or I can add more pictures. So I'll add another picture to show you the effects of the photo. So this is next year's photo, or next week, or whenever you happen to take it, and I'm going to call it 2022. Then I'm going to tap on the camera. Okay, now. Last year's picture, last picture is ghosted behind. There's a slide bar on the bottom that will change the opacity of the background picture. So we're gonna leave it there. We're gonna try and set this picture as close as we can. And then we're gonna hit snap. And we'll click save. Now we've got two side-by-side -side pictures. It also documents the date and the time that you took these photos. So then it's done. Now, you'll return to your main screen. And these are treated like a point. You go to your upload queue. They're treated like a point. They're actually in here. So I've got a previous one that I did that I'm going to delete. Same thing. You can swipe to delete. You've got these other photos. Now, unlike the other ones, the other New observations, revisits, and contested records go straight to the verifier for verification before it comes back to you. Photos, you'll just simply upload, select them, and upload, and it will send it right to your account on edmaps.org. So now when I come back and I go to my invasive map, I will zoom in. And there are my photos. So now you can also navigate to this point and you can access these points at this same location and you can add more in at a later date with the same process. So we'll go back to the invasive map and it shows all your points there. So anyway, now to summarize this presentation, we realize this app isn't for everyone, but we saw a need for a way to document progress over time to prove success or failure. We tried to make it versatile and easy for anyone to use. We hope you enjoyed this and thanks for listening. Next up, our presenter is Rebecca Wallace with UGA, and she is going to present this live. We do here at EdMaps. I am the EdMaps Data Coordinator, and I've been in this position for about 10 years now. So first I'll be talking about data uploads. This is how data enters the database, which populates the website. So it comes from our website forms, as well as forms embedded on our partners' pages. I'll be talking uh, very briefly about data coming from smartphone apps. I'll spend a little more time on data coming from bulk. A lot of our partners have been taking data for years, and this is how they'll send us either old data or data that they have to collect in their own systems. And, uh, and I'll briefly touch on the API as well. So just to give you an idea of how data enters our system, I said it comes from web, it comes from smartphone apps, API, and bulk data. What happens after that? So then it goes to our verifiers. Our verification network is made up of uh, a lot of local and uh, regional partners that have an interest in what's going on in their area and for the species they're interested in. 
So our system first looks at, is this a regulatory species or not? If it's a regulatory species, it goes to our state and federal agency partners. If it's a non-regulatory species, then it goes to the verifiers based on what they've signed up to receive or what we've talked to them and signed them up for them to receive. And this looks at where it's reported, what type of species it is, is it part of a particular project, and in some cases, would this be the first report in a particular area or not? Then the verifiers make their decision. They look at the information provided, maybe they gather more information, and they use this information available to, to decide what happens with the, those particular records. So broadly speaking, they can approve it. So in some level of correctness, it's an accurate, it's an accurate record. They can elect to change the species, and so say someone reports squaro snapweed, and Jerry looks at it and says, no, that's spotted knapweed. He can update that record to the appropriate species, so it shows up on the right maps and in the right downloads. He can, he, they can mark it negative, so if someone's doing a survey for Asian longhorn beetle, someone finds an, a longhorn beetle, the verifier can look at it and say, no, that's a native one, but I want to keep that as a negative record. So you looked for it and did not find it. And then you can, they can also reject it. So they looked at it, they said, oh, it's, it's not what they reported. It, there's no value in keeping it as a negative record, or maybe it's a test record, something like that. They can uh, delete, elect to delete the record, or they can elect to mark it as uh, unable to be confirmed. So there's not enough information. At any of these decisions that are made, a user or another verifier can contest this record. A user can send us an email right now and say, hey, I don't think this is accurate. We will be adding a flag option on individual records as well. So you can literally just press a button and it lets us know. Or another, another verifier can contest the record. A similar to how Jerry showed you uh, earlier with the EdMaps Pro. Once a record is not rejected, the system looks at was it made publicly available or not. And a record that's not publicly available can later become publicly available. This is the entire record itself. Once it's made publicly available, it goes out through our data feeds, our user, user alerts, and anybody can sell and sign up for a user alert so they know what's going on in their area and value-added tools. So our value-added tools are our distribution maps, any custom maps that exist, as well as some graphs. The data feeds include data going out via API, going out through our data downloads, through our recent reports feed, and also going out to specific data partners that we have data sharing agreement with on a automatic or very regular basis. So the data downloads includes data coming out through basically three different ways. Species, this will include data coming from the maps, a data being requested through our advanced query tool, and a custom queries that exist. Now, any which way that data comes out, it's used in a huge variety of ways. This includes informing policy, developing models, in research, we work with a lot of researchers who use the data. People view this as a way to share data if they need to do so. We're also, people can use us as a way to say they've published specifically their data. Uh, a lot of people use us, especially the maps for education and outreach materials, and also to inform invasive species lists, either in creation or in revision. And there is one other way data comes in. So we do get data that we would consider pre-verified or from expert sources. This would include data from, say, herbaria, museums, from literally the expert in a field. This goes in as pre-verified. Now that data, as you can see by it having a purple star, is also able to be contested. So we can have this checks system in place. So data comes in from the majority of our users by two different, by, individually by two different ways. So we get individual records coming from our apps, and the four apps you see on the screen are our primary applications we're going to be uh, using going forward or promoting going forward. And we'll come back around later in the discussion section about some apps you may already be using that still exist. We also get data from our website. We get a, we actually get a lot of data still submitted via our website. Not We're not getting overrun with data from our apps. So there's a lot more fields you see on this on this form. This is only a portion of the website form on the right. And so you get to see a lot more uh, data entry options than exist in the apps. And that for that reason is because nobody really wants to stand in a field in 100 degree weather being attacked by mosquitoes and ticks, you know, while you're trying to fill out life stages and so forth. And then bulk data. So this is a lot 
of what I end up doing. You reach the bulk data uploader by being logged in, going to the My Edmaps tab, and there's a, a bulk data option available. And it's really just a file uploader. You're sending files for me to evaluate and work with you on getting interpreted and uploaded into the database. The image on the right is our upload questionnaire. So we found that I was asking a lot of questions from most of our contributors. So this allows some of those questions to be asked kind of upfront. And so I'm interpreting the data correctly. And it also serves as a check to make sure that everything you're uploading is complete. So you're uploading as most of the complete amount of data as possible that, to make sure it's usable. And we mentioned API in the beginning. So API right now is we're getting data from somewhere else. And right now, our API, the API is mainly pulling from iNaturalist. So we are getting iNaturalist data. We're only pulling research grade. We're pulling it regularly. And, but it's not going straight into EdMaps. So it enters what we're calling the triage system. So anyone who is a state or national level verifier for anything can go into the triage system and look at these records. It's a very coarse level of information provided. As you can see on the left, this is the, the table they look at. And verifiers can look at the information provided there to evaluate if they want those records to go to be individually reviewed in the verifier queue. So that's two verifiers under the manage icon heading. To bulk verify the record. So if it's something that's widespread, not really managed or tracked, maybe it's really easy to identify, they might decide to go ahead and bulk verify this. because. In, in iNaturalist, it's already reached research grade. Or they can elect to ignore. So we do get some data that is native to one area of the country and invasive in another. And so an individual state verifier can decide if they want what would to them be native data in the database or not. We leave that up to the verifiers. And on the, on the left image, there are some links above that search bar that helps our verifiers to know what this whole system is and some cheat sheets and other information. And next I'm going to move on to query tools. So this is kind of looking at the data in, in EdMaps and starting to get the data out. The most basic query tool we have is our distribution maps. This is literally saying, I want to see the data you have for a single species, either on a state-based map a county-based map, a point map, or in a list. So this is what it looks like. So on the left, you're seeing a county-based map, or in the case of Canada, county equivalents. We did add Canada very recently to our county-level maps. This was very exciting. So this shows you at least one positive or treated record has been reported in each of these county or county equivalents. What you're seeing there is just the presence map. It was found there. We also have record density maps. So it tells you how many records have been reported in those counties. We have a literature versus observation map. It's just what type of data is populating those counties. Either it comes from literature or actual observations. And then for certain plant species, we have future range and future certainty maps. And those will be gone over a little bit later in, in Joe's presentation. And on the right shows what a point level map looks like. So this map is of a plant. And so the icons you see for the different colors tell you if this was a negative report. So they looked for it and did not find it. A positive report, they found it, treated, they found it. And at that time they did some sort of control measure or eradicated. So that population they managed is now de determined to be eradicated. And eradicated is, there's different people have different opinions on what constitutes eradicated. So that's, there's not a ton of data in our database because of those reasons. And in the top right corner above the, the map area, you'll see there are CSV, KML, and shapefile icons. And that's for downloading the data. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Under the tools and training section, there's also a, a link called invasive species status by state. So if you click that link, and choose your state, this is what you see. And, and on, as you can see on this image, you can uh, change your state just from right here if you want to view different states rapid fire. But this tells you what's kind of going on at a broad level in your state. What types of species are you seeing? How many records exist for these species in your state? How widespread are the different species? So how many counties have records of these? 
and also how many invasive species are in these counties. So you get kind of a general idea of what's going on in your state and in, in certain counties as well. And then under the My EdMaps section, again, you have to be logged in to see this, you get a few different types of dashboards. When you just click on My EdMaps and you're logged in, you see your dashboard or my dashboard. And this is only showing reviewed data. So this is what you would expect other people to be able to see. So it shows a map of where you've reported recently. And this is a year time span. It's uh, 365 days. They see where you've recently reported and again, reviewed records, some basic numbers on what you're kind of reporting, where you're reporting. You get to see what subjects you're reporting a lot of or little of, what types of species you're reporting. And you can also see your statistics, which is something we carried over from the previous, previous iteration and your recent reports. And these are just your records right here. If you click on dashboard on the left, you can also see the EdMaps dashboard. This is all the reviewed data in EdMaps. So this is, this has a number of filtering options at the top. And once you've figured out what you kind of want to see, then you can get the results for that. So this is showing just all the data in EdMaps for a year, not including bulk data. And I'm seeing how many reports are showing up for different counties in, on our maps. I'm seeing basic statistics on who's, how many people are reporting, how many subjects and so forth. I'm also seeing, again, top reported species. Another, another graph that wasn't on my maps is top reporters because there would only be one reporter for top reporters on my dashboard. So you can see who's reporting a lot. You can see the uh, top eradicated and treated species as well as uh, observed tree eradicated species, you know, what is kind of coming in as a proportion of data. And you can also see where data is coming in from. So do you want to know if in your state, a lot of people are reporting by web or by smartphone, uh, you can have that information. And then finally, this is the, the last of the graphs here and last of the information. You can see where data is coming from and including revisits. You can spend a lot of time just exploring around the EdMaps dashboard to see kind of where data is coming from. It's a lot of fun. And then finally, this is something we launched yesterday. So this is hot off the press. But you can, if you are a verifier, if you're an EdMaps verifier, you can see statistics on what you've verified, what you've reviewed. So you can see a map of where the records are coming from that you're reviewing, how many records you've reviewed, what types of species you're reviewing for, where the data is coming in from, a, a bar chart of the counties you're, you know, you're verifying for. And also you can see your recently reviewed reports. These are the records you've recently reviewed. So you can look at them again if you want to. So now we're gonna move on to downloading data. So the, I'm gonna talk about the main three ways data is downloaded from EdMaps. This is including our species maps, our advanced query tools, and my EdMaps. So I showed you a species map earlier, and I mentioned in the top right corner, there were links for CSV, KML, and Shape. When you press, when you, when you click one of those links, a pop-up comes up that, tell, that asks you, do you actually want to download all of the species data that we have in EdMaps? A lot of people actually don't. So if you only want a subset of this species, you would click here, which is the first option, and that takes you to the advanced query tools. There are some people who are doing single species studies or want to manipulate the data in some way to analyze it. So they want all of the data in our database for that particular species. So we do have that as an option. But most people we found were downloading all of the data for the species when they really only needed a very small portion of it. So I'm gonna take you to the advanced query tools. When you click on tools and training and then advanced query tools, this is the form you are presented with. You get to add a lot of different parameters to get to a data set that is as close to what you're looking for as possible. This includes date ranges, reporters, geographic areas, if you only want positive or treated data, that way you don't have any negative or eradicated data and so forth. Once you're satisfied with your parameters, then you would click submit and you'd end up on a page that looks like this. This is the data that I requested. 
that I wanted to see. And then and again, in the top right corner, I have my sh CSV KML shapefile options. When I select one of those, I'll get a pop-up that says that I'll be emailed with a link when the results are compiled. And finally, downloads. So if you go to my EdMaps and on the left-hand side, downloads, this is the screen you're presented with. In the top left link, download my reports. This would be all of my data, including the unreviewed data. The rest of those links you're seeing are projects I'm part of. So if you're part of a specific project, and most people are not, or there are some projects we work with, but I just want to, don't be surprised if all you have is download my reports. So, but if you are part of a particular project, this is your opportunity to download all of the data from that project at one time. And then below those links are my requests. So these are the requests I've made over the years. And you're seeing on the right-hand side under file, it says file expired. These files are, exist for 30 days for availability. So you can download the, the data anytime within 30 days and access it. And finally, I want to talk about quality management. That's the quality assurance and quality control I talked, I mentioned at the very beginning. Quality assurance is making sure that the data comes in our database as, as accurate as possible. And quality control is fixing things that come up after it's entered our database. So under quality assurance, we have cleaning and formatting bulk data prior to entry. That's me. Ensuring the data entry forms are accurate. That's something I work on with our programmers. And the record review process, which is where our verifier network comes into play. Quality control is getting notified when errors occur, fixing polygons that come in that are invalid, contesting reviewed records. Again, that can be a user, anyone who's using EdMaps, as well as the verifiers and updating species names. So records do occasionally need updating when species names change. So I'm gonna start with bulk data and I'm gonna have several, several images here to show you just kind of what I see as the EdMaps data coordinator. I see a, a fair amount of incomplete file packets. Basically, there are some people out there who are not trained or experienced in uh, shape files and sharing them. So they might not know to share everything that's involved with a shape file. So sometimes we have to work with people on making sure all of the data gets to us. And it isn't just where they only share the .shp, they might forget to share or not be able to share certain other parts of the data because they may not have them or they may not exist. And so the solution I came up with was basically to tell anyone that anything with the same file name send me. So this gives me as much of a file grouping as possible. And, and then that has helped out a lot. We also have issues with what I kind of call multiple conversions. So we have worked with people who take data and map it fast, convert it to KMZs, which are uh, viewable in Google Earth, and then I need to convert it to a shape file to use it. And this is what it looks like in a KML in Google Earth. However, this is what it sometimes ends up looking like in ArcGIS. And this is, this is unusable. So we do work with people on making sure that the data gets to us in as original a form as possible. I also work a lot with individuals on making sure that the information they provide is complete and uh, clear. So in this case, I was submitted data that just in some cases said teasel. There are many species of teasel. So I have to work with them on figuring out which species of teasel. We also have had many conversations about what does zero mean? There are some programs, including ArcGIS, that defaults a zero when a null is more appropriate. So I work with them on, does zero mean it was not found or does zero mean you didn't enter that data? And as you can probably tell, this is the entirety of that data there and there's no dates. So I work with people on making sure that we have this minimum required information. Some other things I run into uh, that's a, a little bit unusual, but does happen multiple times a year, is sharing data between different geographic projections. 
So in this case, someone shared data with me that was in UTMs, when our database is in decimal degrees, specifically WGS84. However, UTMs are different from decimal degrees in that UTMs are reused by zone. So this particular data set was missing the zone, so I didn't know where to put it in the world. Additionally, I sometimes get data where it's missing a unit. So area, but what type of area? Is it a square foot? Is it an acre? Those are two very different areas. So I work with people on that as well. I get a fair amount of data that's coded. So some people use USDA plants codes or other types of codes for quickly noting what species are. So in this case, I had to work with the contributors on what does this field mean? And even after working with them, I still occasionally would have questions about, okay, you know, in this one case, CT meant canva thistle, but this other case, it meant camel thorn. Also, what do these numbers mean? Because they, in fact, did end up meaning something. And then on the right here, this is another data set I received, where, yes, we have a full species name, we don't have a date, but also, what are these park codes? Are they a national, state, city, county, municipality, regional, provincial, you know, you can go on. I don't know where these count these parks are. And also some of these parks may cross multiple boundaries, county or county equivalent boundaries. Duplicate data is an issue on multiple fronts. So I received this file and it had three records in it, but then I also received this file, which also had three records in it. And as it turned out, they were the same data. This data was submitted to me more than once. So I work with the reporter on which data file I should look at. We also get situations where people contribute polygons as well as centroids of points. So again, I work with them on which would be more appropriate for their use. We, we really try to encourage polygons because that gives a better idea of what the infestation is. One other way we get duplicate data is data being contributed to multiple databases. We do harvest or share data with multiple other databases, including a USGS and some other, you know, smaller and larger databases. So if you're sharing data with USGS, we will get it eventually. And it's best to talk with us before, say, you're a, a park ranger, you're submitting data to us for your park, but you're also submitting it up to the larger national, national database for the parks. And then there's the issue of too much data. So this is a portion of some data I received from one file. And as you can see, there are a lot of zeros. So we work together with the contributors to talk with them about, okay, well, what are the required fields? What are the fields that actually have data and are important? We also get instances where data is submitted that isn't actually data. It's recording of other things, management activities or just structures. So again, working with the contributors on, hey, can I remove this? Is this important for some reason? Is this actually representing something else? Which does happen sometimes. And then also submitting unusable shapes. So on the left, I have obviously received data like this. These are tracks or auto logger points. So this is a problem because it, tends to artificially inflate abundance. If someone was submitting this on, you know, and it was a record accounting of Japanese stilt grass, it looks like they're literally submitting every single leaf of, you know, leaf of the grass that's out there, when it would be more appropriate to submit these as polygons or lines. And then on the right, we received data, and once I visualized it, I realized that these are very close to centroids, if not actual centroids. So in talking with the contributor, they in fact did send us centroids because they thought that it would be better to submit points rather than just saying, I found it somewhere in the county. False centroids have caused problems for people in different situations. So we do not use false centroids as much as possible. We also run into occasionally where text-based locality does not match where the point is ending up. So in this case, we were submitted data and they said the data was occurring in Burundi when in fact the points were putting it in a completely different country. In fact, there was a whole country in the middle between these two. So in talking with the reporter, we found out that it was an error on the part of the country, but it can as easily be an error on the part of the latitude or longitude being entered. So we, we can't just assume one or the other is correct. So just some 
basic ideas of bulk data best practices, submit required data. We, we require who, what, where, and when. So just a basic idea, that's the very minimum required. Measurements, in fact, have units. Make sure that you're not assuming we know what they are. Include any metadata or survey protocol you have that is extremely helpful. And then also ask any questions. I, I answer a lot of questions. So I'm, I, and if I'm not answering them, I'm asking them myself. So be sure to ask questions as you can. And then, so from the website's quality assurance that we do, this is what the website form looks like. And this is similar again to the app. It's a little more comprehensive. One thing we do is do a lot with controlled vocabulary. So in this case, what we're doing is limiting the options available, such as drop downs, check, check boxes, and radio buttons for selectors. This really helps to standardize that type of data. The other thing we do is controlling the data type itself. So in a place where you're expecting a number, only a number can be added. Our dates are all formatted the same way, things like that. This helps not just us, but anybody who comes to reuse the data later, it's as standardized as possible. And this is the same way in the apps. And finally, in the quality assurance, this is what the verifier's review record form looks like. The most important fields, in my opinion, are the verification method and the identification credibility. So verification method, how did they come to their decision? Photographs, verifier expertise, reporter expertise, and so forth. And identification credibility is where they say, is it accurate? Is it, I'm unable to confirm, I need to change the subject and so forth. So our verifiers are extremely important in the EDMAP system. And as I put a, a notification at the top, we are always looking for more EDMAPs verifiers. So be sure to email me if you are interested in learning more about being a verifier. And then finally, in quality control, data that comes in with certain parameters that we've decided to flag, we get an email for on a daily basis. So this tells me something was submitted as a synonym, there are discrepancies in the data provided, or there's a bad shape or an invalid uh, shape. So this is the email I get. And just to give you an idea, so this is, this is where I go to fix bad shapes, invalid shapes. So I have a, a table I can look at, I can click on the fix button, and this is sometimes what I see. So this is an invalid shape, and through our, our end, we can fix some of these bad shapes. And the, the reporter is notified when a shape is fixed. Contesting reviews was brought up a couple of times. And so I just wanted to uh, briefly talk about that. This form is uh, something that the verifiers can see. And at the bottom, they can click contest review. So if they see something that doesn't look quite right or that needs to be reevaluated, any verifier can test a review. They're, they're basically allowed to review four that fits their parameters. Any user can see a record and send a link to us for that record and say, I don't think this is right. There's something, some kind of misinformation about this. And we will put that back in the review queue. Again, we do want to add a flag option on the individual records so that an email isn't, isn't required in the future. And then I mentioned updating, updating records. So this record was released and it was unfortunately released as an unknown plant, which means it's not going to appear on any maps. It's not going to appear in, in queries because, uh, except for just, I'm wondering what, you know, I want to see all the plants. So I've been working with the verifier on how we can get this to a, at least a genus level so that these records will be more useful. So this is another thing that I see. So if you have any more information on the EDMAPS website, you can go to the About section. We, it goes over our history. We have a Frequently Asked Questions page and more information about why invasive species are important. We have a Species Info section. So you can go there, click on a species, and see identification information, maps, images, lists, and so forth. We don't have something for every species, but we do have a lot filled out. And then finally, our tools and training page. So a lot of the things we've talked about today, we have training materials on that tools and training page. We have an EdMaps app walkthrough. We have an EdMaps website walkthrough. We have an EdMaps pro walkthrough. We even have a walkthrough on how to verify a record. So if you are wondering how that process works, you can see that. And then finally, one other thing I wanted to mention, we have a report verifier lookup. So if you wanna know who's gonna review the records that you submit, you can go to that tool and look up who will be doing that. 
And I don't think we have any time for questions, but uh, we've been answering questions in the chat as well, or in the question Q and A section. And we also have a half an hour at the end of the day for any questions that come up as well. Okay, thank you so much, Rebecca. Joe will be presenting advanced EdMaps features and data utilization. Thanks so much for being here today. I have to say, I always enjoy seeing Rebecca present because the stuff she has to deal with in managing data is not small by any stretch of the imagination. It's only because she's doing all that work that we can do half of what we want to do with this next section. And, uh... So I get the, the fun part of talking about advanced features that we have in EdMaps and how we utilize a lot of this data. As Chuck made it uh, abundantly clear, we work with a lot of different partners. And it's actually that working with our partners that has made the program a success. We don't build a tool in a vacuum. We reach out, find out what they're doing and how this all has to come together for the common purpose. And that is we're heading towards some sort of management. Chuck was saying earlier, it's, it's all about eradication. I deal on the ag side and I deal with endemic pests from time to time. We're not going to eradicate these things. They're here, they're management goals now. And we just need to make sure everyone's on the same page for what management really should be taking place if we're gonna stay ahead of these things and prevent losses. Everything we do is a balancing act. We have certain information that is needed in order to manage it. We're trying to utilize these different audiences out there willing to contribute data. And where they come together, we start looking at, well, are we getting the data we need to actually have the information we need to, to manage it? And do we have the technology to support it? And this is a nice static diagram kind of highlighting that, but it really is an evolving process of when Chuck started talking about the stuff in 2004, well, the technology wasn't there to do some of the really cool stuff we're doing now. So we keep coming back to this question of how do we get the right information to the right people at the right time in a way they're gonna understand it. And it's across all the things we do for the outreach from our programs. I'm gonna start with data visualization here. And what we're trying to avoid is what you're seeing on the right. I know you should never lead with a bad example, but we're not looking to have our visualizations be a Rorschach test. People shouldn't be staring at it going, well, yes, it's very interesting, but I have no idea what you want me to do. We need to tell them exactly, all right, here is what we would recommend for you to be following up with now. And it's, again, that balancing act, looking at what data is coming in, what partners you have out there, and what they're willing to do to provide data that then can be put into something to help inform management in the field. The fun part about it is down the road, we can later tell different stories with the same data. And so what I've got for you are some examples of where we've been working with folks to show this. The questions I've been seeing in the Q&A section are wonderful and some of them are focusing around well do you have maps that show incidents and severity and well it depends on what you're looking for. So kicking this off we're going to go into one that people frequently have. I have a new invasive in this case kudzu bug came in northeast Georgia and they wanted this map to say all right how fast is kudzu bug spreading? And so you see from that initial infestation in 2009, where they had a reproducing population, and then year after year, they're getting more and more reports further out. What's curious about this is you see that somewhere around 2016, 2017, things started to slow down. You're not seeing numbers in 2020. What's happening behind the scenes or out in the field is you had a pathogen and a number of parasitoids come in that are knocking the population of this new invasive down to the point that when we look at the same data in a different way, this is looking at that data set and saying, how many years has it been since someone was concerned enough to actually report having seen kudzu bug? And we're seeing some places where it's been 10 years since someone's made a report. So have those biocontrol agents been effective enough to actually knock the populations back to where we're not having an issue? Or is there less reporting coming in? 
this is where the working group or the partners we engage are using this to explore those questions and help make everyone aware of what they're trying to do with these efforts. We also have work with a corn disease working group. This is a group out of the, they're actually national and every year they start reporting where they're seeing Southern corn rust and a number of other pathogens. So the gist they're going for with this map is that when this starts out early in the season, you're gonna have stuff in South Texas where it managed to last through the winter. And then it starts blowing up as you not only have the host, but the pathogen starts moving up throughout the country. So they put this map out there to let people know, yes, we're looking for it. And here's where we're seeing it active this season. Again, another group we work with, the Ambrosia Beetle Working Group funded out of the Southern IPM Center. They have trapping sites. They extend beyond the Southern region to work with a number of partners. And when you're looking at these counties, there are actually multiple sites within that county. But they don't want to single out a particular producer's farm. So in conversations with them, they said, all right, look at all the sites in that county. Take the worst case. Use that to give me that color on that map. And then when I click on that map, use that site to actually show me a graph of what the population's been doing. This has been the second year they've started collecting data for this, and it's getting interesting because they're actually getting to discussion of thresholds and where that would affect management. It's not quite there yet, but these are the first steps they're making towards some tools that can help inform management in both pecan and nursery production. Some similar pictures we're seeing here coming out of Kentucky, we're looking at corn earworm. Uh, again, another pest on corn, this time an insect. This is giving, it's kind of messy, looking at where the populations have been in different years. As I said, a little messy, but where this really comes in is someone is going to a particular year, mousing over it and saying, okay, that was what the populations did at this site in 2012. And you've got that average line. So where you see it popping above the average line early in the season, you might want to start keeping an eye out because the populations are higher than we normally see. Contrast that with something they see in 2015 that where they started tracking, they weren't seeing populations. And so that maintained throughout the season, but everyone could kind of see, all right, this is what I'm seeing right now. Is this unusual? Should I be concerned? So all those examples were just basic visualization of the existing data people were submitting. The only way they work is if they have enough cooperators willing to, to submit the extra data. In the case of the corn earworm, they had to report counts from traps. For the kudzu bug uh, maps, that was just presence absence, although there may have been other data in the background. What I'm going to go into now is where we're looking at People taking the data that's available, either through a download, through accessing your API, however we're getting data to them, and producing additional products that add value to that raw data and inform the management decisions. We're going to start with this first one for brown marmorated stink bug. David Crowder's lab out of Washington State University has developed a habitat suitability map for brown marmorated stink bug. And they've done that with the SCRI project that's funded on brown marmorated stink bug and they're collecting more research data within that project. They've been kind enough to let us use that layer and put it up on our maps. And what we're showing now is the overlay of the EDMAPS data, where we have sightings of brown marmorated stink bug, and that habitat suitability map. And we're pushing this out, telling people, here's what the habitat suitability map currently says. We're looking for more data. We're looking to truth out this habitat suitability model and give them data to refine it. So we're using it in a campaign where you have these red records, that's new records since the campaign started, and then gray, where we had existing data prior to that. It not only reiterates that the populations are still active in those areas, but where we are seeing new reports and, and broadening out what we have. We've taken some steps down the road of looking at climate change models. This is work by Jenica Allen and Bethany Bradley, looking at what environmental factors would, be, would have the preferred environments for different invasive species. This one's Canada thistle. 
And so they ran a number of 13 different models seeing whether or not for these different locations, it would be a preferable environment for Canada thistle to exist. This is a great start looking at where these things might be. And we took their data, ran it through our mapping engine. This doesn't have any particular EdMaps data on it right now, although it was used when they were running their models. We followed this up with, all right, if we overlay that map, and allow someone to say how many models they want to look at, we're looking at a comparison of what data is currently in EdMaps and that range model. So in some of these cases where you're seeing that orange, we expect that we probably see some records for Canada thistle there, but for one reason or another, we don't. It could be a shortage of data. It could be a reality. I doubt the reality in many of these cases but it's something that we put out there to help encourage data to come in and help to continue some of these efforts. What is fascinating about this is those areas in the darker purple, where as climate changes, perhaps an environment becomes not as preferable for certain species. And when you start looking at how many models agree, in this case, going to 13 models have to agree for it to keep that lavender color, you see that it's not the case. It opens up discussions and it opens up the conversations and, and additional work that would be done, need to be done in the future to help validate this and take better measurements to know what's going on. One of my favorite groups to work with is the pecan group, not only because I like pecans, but they are a very open group for sharing information and data. This is an example of a pecan nut case bearer map they have where they have individuals monitoring a trap. And when they get two consecutive catches of adults in that trap for pecan nut case bearer, they can use degree days to project forward when they would have 25 to 50% overposition, egg laying in the field. That's the scouting window. That's when scouts need to be out there and active and they need to make their decision about what their management's gonna be for the year. Because after that point, they've kind of settled into where they're gonna be and. That was your management window. So they're willing to share, and this is actually down to, to point locations, and show this so that other pecan growers in the area can say, all right, well, that site's near me. I can see that I probably should be out looking right now just because our climate's similar to theirs. This expanded out then because we don't have all the coverage we'd love to have into a tool that I can drop a point if I've been doing my own monitoring, I can select my date, here's my decision windows. So it takes it from doing a abstract kind of on a map, could be my location, could not, to know this is where I have something. Another group we've been working with on the sugarcane aphid side, this has been where they've been trying to develop a model for knowing when you would see an infestation of sugarcane aphid. As the winter comes through, it drives the populations back down to South Texas and New Mexico. And so the population then builds and spreads as the season progresses. So they're starting to get this model refined to the point of where you're seeing on the left, that presence map saying you're finding it in different counties. They're using that as inputs to start projecting forward where they would expect to see it based on weather pattern and other things. This is great for us because we send them data through, through either downloads or API, and then they're actually taking and building up that model and uploading the model files to us, and we're doing the visualization on our side. So a good collaboration between those two. With this one, this is Cucurbit Downy Mildew, another group we work with pretty, pretty actively. And I said a lot of this was, was models and value-added things that were being put in. This particular map is just how many days has it been since somebody reported seeing cucurbit downy mildew on a particular host. It's a good start to saying, yes, I have seen symptoms this year, and I'm still seeing symptoms this year on different hosts. They wanted to take this a step further. And they've been doing this for a while. It started back um, in New for 15 years. So that's, I'll do math later. They want to do forecasts. So based on the data that was coming in 
Thomas Kiever takes and downloads that, looks at it, runs it through the high split model, looks at the weather for the given areas, and he by hand draws these areas of risk on a map. He provides an overview that you can see there on the right. And then for each day of the forecast, he provides very specific recommendation or risk area notes for each day. This then comes out in what he pushes for his forecast. And we send this out to all the folks that are, are subscribed to it. And they're looking at, here's again, that overview, day one, here's what you should expect. Day two, here's what you should expect. Very straightforward. And from them talking with the pickle packers and all the other groups in that industry, finding out what they need to see to really understand where this goes. And it goes beyond just looking at the raw data coming in. So this takes us into a world of all the stuff we talked about up to this point. There are different visualizations that do exist. We've spent a lot of time working with our partners to understand what exactly they need to see and what they need to show to an audience. Our next trick is actually delivering it there. Um, EdMaps is a wonderful website. However, it's not appropriate for all audiences. There are existing audiences at other places that they need to be able to see this content. And if you tried to make EdMaps one site for every possible commodity and area and everything else, it would get really confusing. So we've spent a lot of time working with our partners, and this is Cucurbit Downey Mildew again, started in 2007. Thank you, slide notes. And for 15 years, they've had this site and been building an audience around Here's the information you need to have. First of all, here's your epidemic status map, and that's embedded onto their site from what our servers. And then here is your reporting form, which looks a heck of a lot different than any reporting form that Rebecca was showing because it's tailored to their particular project and their particular audience for what they expect to get recorded in and what outputs they're gonna have from it. On the right, you can see the forecast that they have there. And then they've got the section of alerts. And you saw, I think some of the alerts that were in the other system that if you wanna be notified about things happening in a certain area, you can provide your contact information and then you can provide what area do you wanna be alerted about? You could be alerted for everything in the US but you could also drop a point on the map and say, if it's within 50 miles of here, let me know. And let me know either about only the new reports or the new reports once a year. And do I want to get an email or do I want to get a text message? So options to control how you want the system to automatically notify you. It sure beats having to always come back and check the map. And, you know, is it, is it here yet? We're beyond that. We can send things directly to people. With that, we also then apply branding. Again, EdMaps is wonderful, but if you throw EdMaps on top of this or AgPest Monitor, they've spent 15 years building this audience. It needs to carry their branding. It needs to have the links to the resources that people would expect to see. And so we've been working with our partners to improve how we incorporate their brand into any messaging, websites, maps, anything else that goes out. The corn disease working group is another good example of that. If it wasn't for extension specialists and agents in all of these states, this map wouldn't exist. And the clearinghouse site they have is nice, but it's not exactly customized to a particular audience. Produce field crop pathology page is. And this is where we need to embed the map, make sure we're centered on Indiana, get the materials they need there. And even if you download the map, I need to make sure it's the Purdue logo in the corner. So they're maintaining their brand and identity. EdMaps and AgPest Monitor are a tool in the background providing the functionality. And we're happy to play that role. We don't have to be the thing up front in everyone's face. We really need to recognize the partners and programs that make this possible. The best example I can think of this is what we've done with Sugarcane Aphid, that MyFields, which is a uh, very nice program for scouting pests out of Kansas State. They contribute data through our API. And out of that, we also give them maps so they can see what's currently going on. So they've got these incorporated into their website. 
The sorghum checkoff wanted to have the maps on their websites. They added them there. When you look at what EdMaps has, EdMaps, the pictures look different because we're showing overall, because that's what our audience on that site needs to see. And in other places, we do have the spread over time maps to show how it's developed over time and how it's been a problem. What's been interesting is when Georgia had this a, a project where they were reporting how bad are the infestations, we were able to produce these maps that were specific to Georgia because they were the only ones submitting that form of data. So they got this and it started a discussion with all the other groups of, all right, well, do we want to all adopt that form of reporting so we can have a uniform map for this? Is there value in this? And that discussion goes on every year to help refine what's going on. That leads me actually to my uh, next part. We all love to assume everything will go to plan. We, we thought of every eventuality. Uh-huh. End of season evaluation is the thing that has to happen because whether, you know, we're not always the team trying to land a rover on Mars. Sometimes we end up in that group in the right. And, you know, COVID happens, some other unforeseen circumstances, and it just does not go to plan. And so there's plenty of gray area in the middle between these two, but it's necessary to get some, some evaluation to know if things are going well. A good example of this we had was in 2019 with tar spot of corn. It's a new and emerging pathogen. And there was a discussion among the corn disease working group. We're showing red on this map. Are we scaring people? Because when you look at this map, if you actually go in those fields, the incidence and severity was fairly low. Yes, it was there, but not at levels that was really gonna be causing a problem. So by showing this in this alarming color, do we have an issue here? From that conversation, we led to revising the map. So this is their new one. They've gone to a more of a warning color of, yes, it's positive, be aware. And they've also added found in previous years, providing context to the map to say, You've seen it before. You're likely going to see it again because it, it hangs out on crop debris. So it's okay. It's here. Just be aware of it and look for it in your fields. We've also, again, tar spot of corn and corn disease working group. When we started building that new map, this was one of the early versions, and there was some concern of going, oh my gosh, look at Iowa. Did it really blow up in Iowa? Is that a, a reality? That's Darren Mueller. He went to all those counties. He found trace levels of the pathogen in the fields. So while we had all the best intentions with this visualization as we were playing with it, had we released this in 2019, it would have possibly given the wrong message. And so we've learned some lessons from that before we actually released it. And we've done some things to make sure that we can give a, a more consistent message to what's going on. I spent a lot of time on visualizations and that's where we've done a lot of our utilization. But going back to that Venn diagram at the front where you have what you need to know, what people are willing to collect and what technology can do. We also focus some of our advanced features on tools that improve data entry. If you can make it so people are willing to give you more information with the same or less effort, generally it's a win on all sides. So we've been looking at how we can help coordinate monitoring programs, helping a coordinator to have a dashboard showing where it is now, where are our known hosts that we can monitor for. And if I do have volunteers, how do I manage who's supposed to go where and look at what and keep all that together? For a participant, it's a little simpler. We need to tell them, I need you to go here and I need you to record this data. So a tool you're going to be seeing released this season is in partnership with the Morton Arboretum that we've put up this map that, that you can select a species you wish to show. In this case, I'm showing Tree of Heaven. Tree of Heaven is a host for spotted lanternfly. The Morton Arboretum and others around Chicago are pretty sure that at some point in their lifetime, they're probably going to see spotted lanternfly show up, and they'd like to be prepared for it. So we're building this tool so that someone can come in and they're making, they're drawing out on here 
where these monitoring zones they want to be looking for would be. And after drawing that zone, they can give it a name, assign users to it, and say what species they want someone to look for. So after I have my monitoring zones on the map, I've got my users assigned to them. Now I have these areas that I can use and say, I want people to monitor in these places. There should be tree of heaven at all these locations based on previous data we've seen in EdMaps. So how can we go ahead and, and send them out for that? This is leading to an expansion to EdMaps Pro that you'll open up the app and see monitoring zones. You'll only see the ones that you've been assigned to. You download them and then on your map, you see, oh, here are locations I'm supposed to go. Tap one and you can either get the Google map directions or you can open up a reporting form if you've already gotten to the location. The reporting form is straight and simple. First one is a question you wouldn't necessarily expect, but it's really useful to kind of pay back the people who contributed data of Tree of Heaven. Is Tree of Heaven still there? Can we get you to quickly just give us a revisit and say yes or no, I'm still seeing this here. And then the second question it asks, do you see spotted lanternfly? And if so, how many are you seeing? Quick and dirty. It's just directing them to exactly what they need to do. No complicated forms, only the minimum. If they were to say yes to having seen spotted lanternfly, there would obviously be a whole lot more follow-up. But for just coordinating volunteers and getting them out there, it's a good survey tool that should help coordinate those activities. The next part I'll go to, and I've seen several people asking in the, the Q&A, do you guys have an API? We encourage partners to work with us. We know that we are not going to build every single tool that could possibly be built. That's kind of ridiculous to think that we would. We need to engage other folks and make sure they have access to the data that's been released and with permission, access to data that they're allowed to see. So for doing this, we do have an API. Documentation is available at developers.bugwithcloud.org. Currently it contains EdMaps and the resource database, which is a collection of fact sheets, websites, other resources, for outreach that we maintain. It's part of the bigger Bugwood umbrella of what we have. The documentation we have for the API is done in Swagger. For those not familiar with it, it's a way of hosting API documentation that's not a pain in the rear. The documentation provides explanations and definitions for what the different fields are. We're always working to improve that and make it clearer. And my favorite feature is this option here to try it out. If I click that option, I then get the option to fill out these different fields, hit submit, and actually see the results coming back from our API. So if you're a new developer or you're just unfamiliar with our API and you want to see the actual results, this is pretty straightforward for getting in, poking it, prodding it, and understanding what you're going to get. The API is going to continue to grow and evolve. Chuck mentioned our image system. We have a presentation system. We're indexing our maps so that all the different ones that are available, people know about them. And we have a system for databasing videos. All that is going to be eventually be included in this for you to access it and use it in your outreach programs. We're all about enabling outreach through common resources. When you're using the API through the developer site, you're using our sandbox server. Sandbox is just like what it sounds. You're meant to go in there and play. It's a development copy of the database that does not have up-to-date information. And it's something that you can submit, delete, do whatever you want to records. It will not affect anything in the real world, meaning production. Our production database is separate, has separate endpoints, separate URLs. So you can try things out, build your applications, get them working like you expect, and then actually get moved to using that on and, and talking to the live data in the system. Feedback is always welcome and encouraged, as I think you might have caught on throughout all those different uh, visualizations. It's a discussion with us. It's, I'm looking to do this. How do we make that happen? 
I would love to say there was a one size fit all solution for everything, but I think you're, if you haven't seen it already, you're gonna see it, it's not. There's a lot of different environments, a lot of players involved, and it's just finding solutions that work for everybody involved. So with that, that's most of the advanced features that we have. I think now we're going to Chuck and another section. Okay, thank you so much, Joe. I see Chuck is uh, live right now, and this is gonna be our last session before our Q&A time, and Chuck's gonna share with us EdMap special projects and spin-off projects, and then we'll get to Q&A. Thank you so much, Joe. That was an outstanding presentation. Really appreciate all the exciting work you have going on. So I wanna start off by addressing a question as we move into talking about the special projects. And one of the questions that came in recently was about a state management plan, updating a state management plan and having a centralized reporting system. And would EdMaps be useful for that? And the answer is absolutely. We have states that are already doing it this way, and we'll be glad to work with you to help it work. And that is I bring that up because that's what tomorrow is about. So today we wanted to give this overview of EdMaps, even for the new user or for the experienced user, some of the new things we're doing. And tomorrow is about how EdMaps is being used in different states, provinces at the local level to continue to grow and aid in invasive species programs. So I hope that helps. I am going to give a short presentation here. My topic was EdMaps special spinoff projects, but some of these projects, the CIPRA model and ISM track are summed up very good in what you're going to see tomorrow is, is the introductions to the panel discussions. And so I decided instead of focusing on a little bit about all the projects, I really wanted to dive deeper into the Wild Spotter project because I think with the audience that we have looking at um, the registration and the attendees, We've got a broad um, group of people that are on today. And, and thank you all for being here and, and sticking with this all day. But I wanted to really challenge this group and show you what we've done with Wild Spotter. And I said earlier that Wild Spotter was like Ed Maps Light. And Joe brought that up in some of his topics and working with different audiences. We want something um, like Play Clean Go, like Don't Move Firewood. Um, like clean, drain, dry. We need something to get the public engaged. And where for professionals and for trained volunteers, EdMaps is the solution and there's tools made for those different audiences. Wild Spotter and where we want to go with Wild Spotter, in my mind, is the next part. It is how we get the public engaged, how we get the public reporting, how we get the public to care about invasive species is a major environmental issue. So I'm gonna play this short two minute video real quick. Sorry, it's a video, but it really gives a good overview of Wild Spotter and why it was built. America's wild places are home to beauty, diversity, recreation, and reflection. But these natural treasures are under attack from invasive species, non-native plants, pathogens and animals that outcompete our native species and threaten the biodiversity and health of every aquatic and terrestrial ecosystem. Invasive species are a major threat to hiking, fishing, hunting, climbing, clean water, abundant wildlife, and all the benefits of being outdoors. America's wilderness areas, wild and scenic rivers, and other natural areas are vulnerable to invasion and degradation. But you, can help fight back against these harmful invaders by becoming a wild spider. <clears throat> to defeat these exotic invaders, we need to know where they are, and that's where you and your fellow citizen scientists can help. Download the Wild Spider app on your smartphone or other mobile device, and help us keep a lookout for invasive species when you're visiting your favorite wild places. When you spot them, follow the app to make sure we get the information we need. What, where, and how extensive is the impact? It's easy to do while enjoying the great outdoors. 
By uploading this information to the Wild Spotter website, you'll be helping to assemble the first ever nationwide inventory of invasive species in America's wilderness areas, wild rivers, and other natural areas. You'll also learn how to reduce and stop the spread of these insidious invaders and protect America's rivers, mountains, forests, and all wild places for future generations. So make a difference. Volunteer to join the Wild Spotter campaign today. Learn more at this website. Spread the word, be a wild spotter, and help stop the invasion. So, and hopefully that came through okay. So, Wild Spotter is not just an app, it's not just a website. It is a campaign to focus on educating the public as they visit our national forest initially on what the problem of invasive species are, where they should look for them, and what they can do about them. And so, you know, how is it different than iNaturalist? How is it different than other things? iNaturalist is an app where you can report um, anything and it goes into a database and, and, and is made available. With Wild Spotter, we're trying to educate what the species are, what they should be on the lookout for, and what they can help do with it. And so I want that to be clear. And as I go through this and briefly give you an overview of what Wild Spotter is, remember that part. This is an integrated approach. It's more than just an app, but it's tied into what we've been talking about all day. So the tools that our, that our land managers, our states are already using in EdMaps, all of this data is going in there, but focused on that public audience. So we started Wild Spotter, launched it a couple of years ago with some pilot forests. And here's where they were. They're spread out across the, the U.S. and in the different regions of the national forest. We continued and have expanded that. We also worked with Bureau of Indian Affairs and have launched this for some of the tribes in Montana. And then we're starting to expand. And the plan had been that we were going to go national forest wide in 2020. Well, obviously in 2020, things changed and we decided to hold off on, on expanding the launch just because of COVID and, and not having some of the visitor centers and all open for the, for the National Forest. So what we've been doing in that time frame is gearing up. So as things open back up, we will be able to expand and, and the forest are ready, we'll be able to expand and have this available for all of the National Forest. This allowed us to upgrade and, and do some things in the back end that when we do that launch are going to really be useful and really be helpful. So with the Wild Spotter website, we launched this new website focused, and I'm going to go through and show you a few things about it, focused on really that outfacing out, you know, people involved in outdoor recreation. We've created a Facebook group that has over 3,000 um, followers and likes. We've built partnerships with a bunch of different organizations, everywhere from outdoor recreation companies to other nonprofits to the different primary invasive species prevention campaigns. So we've tried to make sure in doing this was not recreating something, but this was working with Play Clean Go. This was working with Don't Move Firewood. This is worth working with clean drain dry. You know, we see the components. I mentioned, you know, it's partly a website, it's partly the EdMaps platform, but a big part of it is the marketing and the promotion. And so we've done some initial advertising just to get the brand out there in and working with Wildlife Forever in some different types of outlets where people who are interested in being outdoor would come across it and then really trying to focus on ways to recruit volunteers. And one of the short panelist presentations tomorrow is going to talk about some of the experience they had in doing that. And we're trying to personalize everything to the, to the National Forest. And so this is where the work comes in. This is where it takes building that relationship with the wild place, in this case, National Forest, 
getting the species that are important to them, including those species, looking at what vectors and pathways would be the, the heaviest hit and where people should look for it. And so just to quickly kind of show you the website, trying to show different people, features the partners as part of it, linking to their websites. I mean, really explaining, you know, what this is, you know, we're trying to promote this awareness, engaging the public so we can ultimately take this data that's coming in and share it with the forest that's doing the management on that. So they will know, you know, where hopefully find new infestations, the EDR, the EDRR that I mentioned this. And, you know, not only is it just promoting the project, but also we focused on making the website where you should look, you know, what are the places where these invasives are more than likely going to show up and you're going to see things, you know, what you should look for, tying in the species profiles, showing information about these wild places and about the partners and things you can do to help prevent invasive species. So, so that becomes part of what they're learning as they use this project. Continuing to build and expand the frequently asked questions and other information about it, you know, and doing more outreach like this, like what we're doing today to extend and continue to share this information. We've made it very easy to become a partner. If you're interested in Wild Spotter, please go on the website, sign up to be a partner for your organization to be a partner so we can build this network of these different organizations promoting this concept. And then ultimately we can figure out how to get the public areas that you work in added. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. For each of the forests, we've integrated some maps and information and then really where you know the tool is, like we've been saying and, and why we spent so much time focused on EdMaps and EdMaps Pro becomes in the smartphone device. It becomes that tool that they're going to have in their hands when they're out in the field. And when they open it up, they, they learn about the app, they learn about the project with, with welcome screens, and then they choose what wild place is near them. And, and this is sorted by the closest. And like I said, we're focused on national forest right now, but it's going to show you the national forest is closest to you. And then, you know, we made this interface very simple. We tried to you know, make it very clear, very user-friendly, what you can do, um, very basic. And, but then some similarities to what we saw earlier with the, with the EdMaps app, you know, making where you can sign up, incorporate that species information, allow you to report, upload the pictures, just like we saw earlier, learn more about the wild place. And I'm going to talk even more about one of the cool features we've added to this. And we'll be adding to this when we roll this out larger. And then one thing that we're, the, the last part that we're doing is because we're sharing data between EdMaps and the U.S. Forest Service database, we're going to be incorporating the data sets for that forest into Wild Spotter. So when the user is out in the field, they can look and see what's already been reported around them and then do that revisit concept that we were talking about in EdMaps Pro. Just very simple. Is it still there? And so that's something, the next step that we're going to be doing to this to allow users to pull that data set based on their favorite wild place and update that information. So I mentioned the marketing, we've put together a lot of materials tied along with Wild Spotter to really build the brand along with the Facebook. And here's really where we've spent some time building these promotional materials and having those available, both with some printed copies as well as, as well as some downloadable versions that you can pull and, and print yourselves. We tested out a bingo at a citizen science conference a few a couple of years ago. And it was very successful in invasive species bingo. We actually shared that with one of the national forests and they used it. But we're also trying to come up with these other kind of, you know, fact sheets and activity sheets, a comparison of the difference between Wild Spotter and iNaturalist. And looking at when we talk about how big an infestation is, putting it in terms that the public's going to understand. You know, is it the size of a basketball? Is it the size of a car? Is it the size of a school bus? 
And then, and Bell mentioned this, but, but figuring out how, as we build new boot brush stations with marketing on them, how we can include the wild spotter branding as part of that. And also we're building some fact sheets for the forest, you know, posters that can go up and, and, and be included at, you know, his handouts as part of it. We're also adding in gamification to this. So, and to add bats as well. So we're going to have badges that are going to show up in the app, you know, to kind of give that reward back to the user. And finally, and this is what's going to be really cool and really useful to the public. So when you choose your wild place, you're going to be given the option to download the, the map of that wild place. And so you will be able to, for all the national forests, you will be able to pull that in. It will have all the roads, it will have all the trails, it'll have the campgrounds and, and major landmarks, like what you would have on a visitor's map but laid on top of the Google map interface within WildSpotter. So the app WildSpotter will become useful for users to be able to see that detail. And I've got a couple of examples um, here of what that looks like in the Android version. And so really being able to, you know, see that detail, zoom in on that detail when you're out there and use it as part of, as part of, you know, the tool that they're using when they're out in the field and just a, an add on feature for a reason for them to want to use the wild spotter app. So I want to wrap up and, and really say, and I think this will address a, a, a few of the questions as well. We're trying to figure out how we roll wild spotter out beyond just the forest service. And that's something we really um, want to work with groups to do. The Forest Service has invested a lot of resources in getting this set up um, and running. And so one of the concepts was looking at the sagebrush conservation efforts that are going on in the Western United States and how invasive grasses especially are a real big part of that. And looking at ways we can partner with the state agencies and the federal agencies to expand and maybe focus on that Western United States and is a starting point, but there's a lot that goes into adding the, your local wild places, adding state parks, adding national parks, adding that the commitment's got to be there from the organization in order for this to really work because you don't want people going out and reporting a lot of a lot of invasives on state parks or in other areas if there's not going to be some follow-up to it. So we're not opening this up just where any area will be added because we want to do it and add it right. So, you know, if you work for a state provincial or federal land management agency, I would say ask the question, how can we get involved in Wild Spotter? Get in touch with us and we will figure it out because what we want to do and where we want to be, I think that over the COVID, over the last year of COVID, we've seen a lot more interest and a lot more, you know, people want to get outside, people want to do things, people want to explore the national parks and national forests and wildlife refuges and our state parks and, and these wonderful lands. And so let's come together around this wild spotter concept. And, and make it the way for the public to help protect our, our wild places. And so with that, we can, and if you have questions about Wild Spotter, then Rachel, who did the, the presentation earlier, will, will be glad to, to help you out with general questions. And please contact me if, you're, if you want to expand, if you're looking at ways we can expand Wild Spotter into your organization. Thank y'all very much. We've got a lot of questions in the, in the Q&A that we will start going through and open it up for all the panelists. And then please join us tomorrow. We're going, we've got four panel discussions on four different topics. And I think I've seen the opening presentations and they're really good. And there's going to be some really good discussion after that.
All right. Thank you so much, Chuck. That was great. All right. So we have reached the time for our Q&A block. So I'm going to ask all of our presenters today, whether you are live or recorded, go ahead and pop your camera back on. Keep yourself muted unless you're answering a question and speaking just to avoid some background noise for us. But again, I just want to express my gratitude to everyone who both helped us set up this event sponsor this event and provide information. Today was absolutely outstanding. I know I learned a lot, so thank you everyone. Okay, I am going to kind of do my best to get through some of the questions we have. I wanna thank those presenters that have been answering in the Q&A box, typing things in. And Molly, if you could just add Kevin to our panelist list, that would be appreciated so we can get him up here. Chuck, I think this first one might be for you, but anybody feel free. Oh, there's Kevin. Great. I'm going to kind of group a couple of questions here. So there are a number of questions about how EdMaps works with other systems. And ISM Track, the USGS Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database, the USGS Bison, the Western Governors Association Data Campaign, which we talked about in December at our monthly webinar, iNaturalist, you talked about a bunch, and obviously WildSpotter. Those were all the different systems that were put kind of into the chat and questions. How, how does EdMaps work with these other systems? And subsequently, if somebody enters data into one of them, is it viewable across them all? Or do folks need to be reporting to all these different systems? Maybe Chuck, you could start us off on that one. Yeah, so so there there are there are multiple different systems, multiple different ways to do data. Anything that is a project that we run is all going into the same database. So if it's WildSpotter, if it's ISM Track, if it's I've got one, if it's Maiden, if it's Glendon. All of those are all part of AgPest Monitor, all part of the EdMaps database. So that's part one. The Western Governors Association data mobilization campaign suggests that you submit data to one of the four major systems. And those four major systems are EdMaps, IMAP Invasives, USGS Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database, and, and USGS Biodiversity information serving our nation or bison. The USGS NAS system is focused on aquatics. And so we do have a very good relationship sharing data back and forth with them. We've also worked with iNatural, IMAP Invasives on sharing data from their system and back to our system. We have a good relationship with USGS Bison as well. Their system includes some data that we don't want as part of EdMaps because of, it, of, of the scope of that project. And they also don't have pictures as part of, of their system. And they don't have an, a way for individuals to submit data. So there's, there's these slight differences between the different systems, but we've all made the commitment that we're working together and each of us kind of provides different tools for different, different needs. I'll kick it on the ag side. That collaboration's continuing out. I mentioned my fields. We also work with farm dog, working with measure IO. In my usual slide deck, because there's a lot of different folks working in ag trying to track pests, I honestly don't care what system you use. They all built some wonderful tools. Are they willing to share data? The answer is yes, we have no problem. And leave it to the geeks in the background to figure out how to make sure we don't end up with duplicate data, make sure we carry record identifiers, all that fun geek stuff that we just have a great time, we handle that. And those conversations are going on and trying to make it better and better every year. And I also say, somebody said, recommend reporting to one invasive species platform, what would it be? So it would be EdMaps, obviously. And, and but for some audiences, it, that's where WildSpotter and some of the other systems play in. So I didn't want to ignore that part. And somebody asked about GBIF and being partners with GBIF. GBIF and, and Bison are, Bison is the U.S. mirror of GBIF. And so once the connection between EdMaps and Bison is, is completely there, then all the data from EdMaps will be part of GBIF as well. Okay, thank you so much. We have a couple of questions about privacy. 
and how to protect data from states' requests to review files, from Freedom of Information Act, from state regulatory agencies that might use it to enforce. Can you download the records with geo privacy enabled to protect private landowners? There's quite a few questions in there about the privacy issue as it relates to enforcement. So can anybody speak to that a little bit? I can talk briefly about location privacy and then Chuck or Joe can get into things like FOIA. So as Rachel and some of the other people who have talked so far have mentioned, there is a field on the apps on the website called private or hide exact location. This allows a reporter to say, okay, well, maybe for my own purposes, I want this exact location known, but if this record should be come public, it should only be at the county level. So we have worked with groups in the past that maybe they also did work on endangered species and they don't want those locations known because someone could come in and poach orchids or carnivorous plants or there's, you know, sensitive wildlife nearby that can't abide humans. So we do have that private coordinate feature available. Now, a verifier in the review process can also make a record private. So if the verifier notices this is on private land or it's in a sensitive area that they don't necessarily want people to be in, the verifier also has that opportunity to make a record private. And when I'm saying publicly available, I mean shows up on, on our maps, shows up in queries, shows up in data downloads. The only people who see those coordinates are the person who reported it, if you're part of some of those projects Joe was talking about, where you're part of like a, a, a group of people all working together, and in the review process, the verifier sees it. And that's for that reason, the, the reason we have that is because if you're reporting hydrilla or, or something aquatic, but the point shows up in a agricultural field, that's a problem that that gives you cause for like okay let me look into this a little bit further and again they only see it in that review process they when they go to download records it's not going to be in the downloads it's not going to show up on their own maps anything like that but as far as some of the like whole record things chuck and, and joe can get into you know foia and things like that and i'll add there's also one other place on a individual's profile they can mark that they wish to be anonymous. Publicly, if someone were to look at the record, it would say something like, corn disease working group participant. The people in the project know who it is, but publicly it doesn't say Farmer Bob because everyone knows where Farmer Bob lives and he doesn't need that kind of advertising. So one other area of, of protection. And I mean, and I guess the last thing I'll say, so EdMaps is a ongoing research project, which provides some, some coverage in terms of FOIA type request, because you don't publish on something until the project's over. So that helps. But at the same time, if data is not meant to be shared with a regulatory agency in the state or area, then it doesn't need to be submitted to, to EdMaps in terms of, in, in most cases. And, and Joe, you can correct me on part of that, but in most cases, the, the verifier network is tied to those regulatory agencies. And so one of the questions was along those lines, and I think that needs to be clear that in, in a lot of cases, we're working with the regulatory agencies to make sure, especially for something that would be a regulated pest, that they're aware of it. And so, you know, where I don't want to say don't report something, but I think the understanding when you report something is going to those verifiers. And in a lot of cases, those verifiers are in those regulatory agencies. From a pragmatic standpoint, I'd like to know the example of you. I understand someone being concerned about regulatory action being taken against them because of a report. I'm going to, for a second, say that perhaps some of the regulators have a good head on their shoulders in some cases, and they're trying to manage something that could be a much larger issue. 
So at some point, a discussion needs to be had about certain things and where they are. <laughs> Regulators are a fact of life. You're not going to get away from them. And if you say, well, I'm not going to report it, and you just leave the issue to develop somewhere, I don't see that ending well for the environment that you're trying to protect. So uh, there needs to be a civil discussion about the situation. And as Chuck said, if, if you're really trying to hide it from anybody, then uploading it into any system would probably be a bad idea. We are looking at some ways to map things at a finer for, for records to not show up is in, we've been very intentional of not putting centroids on counties for level re reports that are only at the county level. So, but we also recognize that some of your counties in the Western United States, or, or I think somebody mentioned Hawaii, you know, are as big as Rhode Island or bigger. And so, so we need a way to show that finer resolution without it just being at the county level. So we're, we've got some grid maps and some other maps that we're working on to be able to, to visualize something without it being at that level. Oh, and we did have some, there's like five quick poll questions that we would like everybody to answer. I know, you know, we're getting to the end and, and we're going to start losing people, but, but yes, if I think those are propped up. So if you would fill those out, that will be great as we are, as we're figuring out best ways to move forward with this. And we're going to have more of those tomorrow as well. Okay. So those poll questions have popped up. So go ahead while we're just chatting and doing Q&A, go ahead and answer those questions for us. Thank you so much. Okay. I think that this was already covered, but I just want to make sure everybody is clear since we've talked about a number of apps today related uh, to EdMaps. So for our friends in Florida, do you want them using I've Got One or EdMaps or does it not matter? What should folks in Florida use to put their data in? Yeah, so it really does not matter. And and it doesn't even really matter with, with Glendon Maiden, those older apps as well. S those apps will ultimately be, be retired. And the primary, there will be four primary apps to report to EdMaps. And that will be WildSpotter. I've got one that we're going to focus a little bit on the public and, and maybe expand more nationally or internationally. And, and then EdMaps and Ed, EdMaps Pro. Those are going to be at the four apps, the four main ways to get data from your smartphone into EdMaps moving forward. But if you love EdMaps West, you don't have to stop using EdMaps West right now. And then Rebecca, I think you had a slide comparing the two, but when should somebody use EdMaps versus EdMaps Pro? When do you upgrade to Pro? Yeah. Okay, so this doesn't have, I've got one on it, but it has the three other apps Chuck was just talking about. And it kind of gives you an idea of who, who would be best suited to which app that we put out. And so it gives you an idea of, okay, if you really need a field guide, you probably shouldn't use EdMaps Pro. If you're just a casual observer or maybe even like a trained volunteer or citizen scientist, you probably shouldn't be using EdMaps Pro because it's just, it's, it's a little more complicated than most people need. But if you're some sort of land manager, uh, you work as maybe an ecologist or a biologist or something where you're in your professional job, you're having to manage a particular area and you have a pretty good grasp of the species you're going to be reporting, that's when I'd start recommending EdMaps Pro, especially if you're very interested in revisiting existing records, or if you're, especially again, if Jerry mentioned earlier about verifiers having the ability to do in-app, in-field verifications, that's really important for a lot of people. So this, this is a, a document I created just for helping people out. And there's one other thing I created, which goes for EdMaps and iNaturalist. So this is the whole EdMaps concept and looking at, again, the whole iNaturalist kind of concept as well. And this was developed, and I use iNaturalist for reporting, you know, I saw, you know, a squirrel tree frog and, and I saw, you know, a really cool bird. And so I do use iNaturalist for that, but this is a, a slide from a presentation I gave a couple of years ago. And it just kind of gives a really brief breakout 
of what the differences are. One of the big differences between EdMaps and iNaturalist, in my opinion, is that iNaturalist does not take in data from anywhere else. All the data in iNaturalist came from people reporting in iNaturalist. So they don't have the U.S. Forest Service data or the National Park Service data or USGS aquatic data or anything else. Um, take any data you know from us from edmaps they everything in their database is from their their community that's kind of a big thing that is a big difference but this gives you a, like i said a general breakout of the different the differences between these two and if you can only have one app on your phone and you're a casual observer and you want to report you know the really cool spiders you're seeing as well you can use iNaturalist and it's likely that the records for invasive species will make their way to us eventually. Okay. This question, maybe back for Rebecca or somebody else. How does EdMaps vet the verifiers that QC your data? Do the verifiers undergo some sort of training so that they know all the aspects of data quality control according to EdMap standards? And can you just speak a little bit more about verification and using the triage system? So that's kind of a couple yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah, I'll here. start. And if I forget something, Joe, Joe or Chuck can chime in. Because there is an, an aspect where that I can't remember if Joe covered or not with the experts and things like that. Okay, he's shaking his head. So I, we have conversations with anyone who wants to be a verifier or anyone we reach out to try to include in our verification network. The most broad way to say it is we talk to people who have education, training, as well as they are often in some aspect in the, in the, in the field. So maybe they are working with SISMAs or CWMAs, maybe they work at state and federal agencies, county parks, whatever, but in some aspect, they have the experience and the, the training to identify these species. We do have a kind of a uh, quiz we put up or developed in the last year that is only for making sure that verifiers can navigate our system. It's not a test to see if they can identify certain species. It's just to make sure they can navigate our system and the capabilities it has. We are working on a certified verifier badge or icon that we want to put on our verifiers profiles as well as kind of next to their names you know the check mark you get or the badge you get on, on different social media for saying you know yes i'm a famous person we are working on that but for some of our states we also have allowed people in those states to be admins to a, to a degree and so what they can do is there a verifier admin? They can add admin, uh, they, as an administrator, they can add new verifiers. So if, if Jerry or Kevin wants to hop on to talk about how they do things as at their local level, that would be a good idea. Okay, in our, in our local level, we've been working on this for many years now, and we've tried to get our weed, weed supervisors in the state to be our verifiers. We have yearly trainings. We have universities come and do on-site trainings. Chuck's been to a few of them with us. We've done a lot of the EdMaps training also to verify. If we can't get a county to participate, which most do, we've had some kind of an extension person that could do it for us. What else, Kevin? I think that's pretty much everything. It's just, it, it takes a collaborative effort, it seems like, from the whole state to be able to accomplish this. And we, and like Jerry said, we have everybody involved. And, and like I said, we just kind of train ourselves. And most of them are all the county weed supervisors that are aware and, and are able to be able to either get it from, you know, a, a species and check it out or a photo or something like that. And it makes it fairly simple and easy to run through those questions that we've went through and answer them and be able to have it verified by, right back out to the users. We've had some really good luck and Chuck's shared a lot of our experiences with people over the last few years about finding infestations in our state that were never known before. So it, it's all about I think using this app for us is all about finding out what's next door to you. So it's been, been quite a good thing for us. Is that it, Chuck? 
you think? Yeah, I mean, and just any other tips that y'all have for getting, I mean, it, getting, you know, the worst word, words in the English language are, if I could speak, are we've always done things this way. And so is getting past that. And that takes time. And you're not going to um, get every county on board tomorrow. You're not going to get every state on board tomorrow. You're not going to get every federal agency on board tomorrow. But, you know, you have to look at this is, you know, we're trying to solve this problem. It's, we've, it's taken us almost 20 years to get to the point that we're at now. And we're going to be working on it for the next 20 plus years with different presenters for EdMaps Summit 20. But but we are uh, going to continue to to grow it and develop it because some things like this just take a while to get everybody on board and everybody, you know, on the same plate because, well, we've always done it this way. Why should we change? Yes, find your value and then run with it. Okay, thank you for that. For those county weed managers and other managers that are using the systems, do you prefer monthly uploads, annual bulk uploads? How often do you want to see their data if the answer is not, you know, live uploads? <laughs> So bulk data, I say whatever is most useful for your program, because we do have some people who have to do reports more than once a year, say quarterly reports, and so they need data in more often than once a year. But there are some programs that for them it's easier to submit once a year. If you're going to be submitting, I mean, once a year is fine just in terms of logistics because I basically have to do the same thing each time. It's just the volume of data changes, which only increases the difficulty a little bit because I have, there's a lot of stuff that goes into formatting data for going from one database to another. So it's really what works best for your system and what your needs are. Okay, thank you for that. We do have a, a few minutes left for Q&A, but just wanted to let everybody know that those results are up there and we appreciate you taking them. I know, Chuck, when you were talking about Wild Spotter, I think you already mentioned this, but the question came in a couple of times about the National Park Service using Wild Spotter. And if there was a park that was willing to jump in, what's the process for them to participate? Should they email you or Mike? Or I mean, it all depends on what level. And, you know, it, that, that's a, a great question, Elizabeth, because there's not a good answer for it. But there becomes a point where, you know, maybe you're not going to get every park on board but if but there's no reason to push this out and make this available for all the parks if a good majority of the parks are not on board and so and i think that sometimes it's more efficient to do things at a larger scale than it is to do things individually so we kind of learned that as we, as we were doing and as we were figuring out adding more forest it finally came to the point that it was like okay let's just do it for all of them because it it that makes more sense. It's more consistent. And that was one of the biggest questions we got were when is, when's my forest going to be added? And so, so that's where I hope that we can find some solutions, both at the, the state level and at the, and yes, we could expand into Canada as well, but for wild spotter, but, but yeah, it, I think we need to find, look at the larger scale and ways that we can form these partnerships and, and everybody help support the program and that's, and then help grow the program as well. Um, that helps. And we have been trying to answer some of the questions in, in the chat, and I think some of them will be um, answer tomorrow. But if you did not get your question answered, please reach out to us, bugwood at uga.edu is the email address that you can always get. And Rachel has to dig through those and figure out who they get sent to. So, so I can easily just name that and just like giving her cell phone number out. But, but, but reach out to us that way and, and please join us tomorrow. We've got a great lineup and, and I think you'll really be, you really learn a lot of more details about some of the great things folks are doing. I, I do want to make one thing as clear as possible because this was a, a question a couple different times. How much does it cost to use EdMaps or EdMaps Pro? To use the apps, to use the website, 
it's free. Anybody can sign up for an account. It's free to use. It's free to request the data. It's free to make queries. It's free to submit records. The only time anything really cost comes into the picture is if we start talking with different programs or groups about building new features or new tools. But just as an average person or a program that doesn't need anything more than we've already built, it's completely free to use. I'll tag on to that. My other role in life is I'm one of the directors for the Southern IPM Center. And that IPM Center has a supplement to help with technology nationally. And we've told folks, if it's already been built and something in our suite of tools, you're welcome to use it. And we'll help give you training on that and get you off and running, including help on getting the things customized and put into your website. So we support a lot of that work for the corn, soybean, wheat, sugarcane aphids. All that work is being covered under a little bitty supplement from USDA NIFA. Thank you, USDA NIFA, for the Regional Coordination Program. We have a lot of tools that are just freely available. And it's the extra development that Rebecca mentioned that, all right, this is going to take a programmer's time to get to you something new and something you're going to like. That's where the cost comes in. And that's usually where we actually end up being a partner on grants. So it's not coming out of your pocket. I don't know of anyone probably in this audience who's sitting around with a giant pile of money next to their desk. If you do, give me a call. But, <laughs> you know, we got to find ways to work together and make this happen. Well, like I think that is the perfect closing statement for us today. Oh, Jerry, did you have a, something you wanted I to share? Partnerships. We've had the Forest Service has really been a big partner in this. I don't think it could have been done without them. I just wanted to say thanks to them also. Well, again, this was an outstanding day. We so appreciate each and every one of you and all of the people that attended today. We clearly, based on the poll results, raised the collective knowledge on EdMaps.